Also note the displacement in Veras and Velgas, and note whether is there an, any impaction of the articular fragments? Why? Why is it important? Because that will suggest me, like in this case, you know, I can see this impacted fragment in a pylon injury, but the anatomy of this intra-articular fragment, which has moved proximally, is not very clear. However, when I do these coronal and sagittal CT scans, it shows me where my fragment has gone. So the importance of understanding these fragments by a CT scan is an important assessment to be made radiologically, which will help us in planning the treatment of such cases. Coming to malleolar fractures. Of course, we describe them unimalleolar, bimalleolar, or trimalleolar. But how, what we are doing for them, we are doing routine AP lateral view, and we are also adding a special view called a mortise view. Now, this mortise view is taken in 20 degree internal rotation, and this is how it looks the AP and mortise view. And what we are looking in the mortise view, we are looking at sentence line, we are looking at arcuate line. A break in the sentence line will suggest a syndesmosis. Disruption. A break in the arcuate line will suggest us fibular shortening. So that's how these, these kind of special x-rays and these assessments, they give you an indication what you are handling, and then you plan your treatment accordingly. Melonar fractures have been classified in two different ways, you know, the large Hansen, which is based on injury mechanism, and the Weber system, which is based on the level of fibula. So the large Hansen system has a first word which describes the position of the foot and the second word describes the deforming force. And, uh, you know, uh, to see now how these, these nomenclatures are correlated, we have this Weber A type of injuries where the fibular fracture is below the distal tibial articular surface. And in stage one, you'll get only isolated fibular fracture. But if the deforming force continues, it hits the medial malleolus, produces a vertical kind of shear fracture of the medial malleolus. So these are supination adduction injuries according to large Hansen. But there is no syndesmosis injury in these kind of fractures. This is Weber type B. Now in Weber type B, the fibular fracture is starting at the tibial articular line. It is before the fibula fractures, there is a disruption of the anterior syndesmotic ligament because the talus is rotating externally. So this is, according to Latch Hansen, these are supinated external rotation injuries, and these are called stage one, whereby the ligament ruptures, stage two, when the fibular fracture takes place. And if the force continues, we go on to the stage three and stage four of the Latch Hansen. And with stage three, the posterior malleolus a uh, fragment or the posterior syndesmotic ligament rupture, any of these takes place, and the stage four, the medial malleolus fractures. So you have a trimalleolar injury kind of a thing with a complete syndesmotic disruption in supination external rotation stage four injuries. This is one good example where you can see all the stages in one particular trimalleolar injury. And then comes the Weber C. Here, the fibular fracture is starting above the tibial articular line. So this could be, uh, this is always happening with pronated foot and with external rotation injury or with abduction. So here is an example of pronation external rotation injury taking place, producing a high fracture of the fibula. The Syndesmosis ligament in this situation usually can rupture directly, or sometimes it takes a fragment of the tibia from the anterior telox or from the posterior malleolus. And these are the different patterns of syndesmosis uh, uh, disruption which can happen with supination external and pronation external rotation injuries. So the role of CT scan in these kind of injury becomes important. Remelt has classified these supinate, these syndesmotic disruptions into type A, B, C, and D. And these kind of detailed study with the CT scan gives us a great guidance in planning our treatment and doing a good internal fixation after reducing these all components of injury. 
before I stop talking about medullar fracture, uh, one word which I want to tell everybody that if you find only medial medullus fracture on AP view and you find another posterior medullus fracture on the lateral view and you see an intact fibula, beware. See this example? Only medial malleolus and a posterior malleolus. Now, in this situation, it is always important to take a full length x ray. And you find here a high fibular fracture, so called a variant of PER, uh, named as Masanov fracture. So, include the knee joint if you are looking into, uh, if you are suspecting your injury to be a PER kind of an injury. Talking a bit about sprains, where the X-ray is negative, not showing you anything, but the clinical presentation is nearly same. Swelling, pain, inability to bear weight. Well, all these injuries, they would resolve with conservative treatment most often. But if there is a failure to resolve, then you need the help of MRI. MRI can, is a very, very good tool, whereby in a fat suppressed images and proton density images, you can see the anterior telofibular ligament very clearly. Uh, and you can see these uh, CFL quite clearly in the axial sections as being seen here, here, and here. And then next is injuries to the medial collateral ligament. So beautifully, you can see in the coronal views, the whole of the medial collateral ligament, the deeper part and the superficial part. And that's how in, in ligament injury assessment, MRI becomes an important tool. Uh, talking about a little bit of uh, non-traumatic condition, the osteoarthritis of the ankle is easily diagnosed on the basis of reduction of joint space, presence of osteophytes, and irregular articular surfaces. Whether it is a post-traumatic degenerative arthritis, there also we'll find the same changes. And uh, except in the post-infective, which maintains the articular space for a long time before it goes out. So in these kind of situations, to make an early diagnosis, MRI is very helpful, which shows us subchondral cysts in the PDFS images. Similarly, to diagnose avian talus, wherever we are suspecting it, though we are seeing a bit of sclerosis on the superior margin of the talus, but when we do an MR, the proton density images are able to tell us not only the a diagnosis of avian, but also the extent of the avascular necrosis happening in the talus. Coming to the foot, I would divide the foot into hind foot, mid foot, and forefoot. And first, let us take the hind foot. A very common reason for hind foot pain is subtalar arthritis, and is, is seen on the lateral view by the diminution of subtalar space. But more sensitive and more specific test is to do an MRI and look at subchondral edema and uh, articular uh, cartilage involvement on the PDFS images. Uh, calcification on the posterior aspect of calcaneus like this is always suggestive of degenerative Achilles insertional tendinosis and the calcification happening in the distal part of the Achilles tendon. So, the posterior pain, whenever you have and you have this presentation, this is the diagnosis which comes to your mind. Similarly, the plantar heel pain, and you see this big spur on the plantar aspect. So these are associated with the plantar fasciitis. Looking at calcaneus lateral view and calculating these bowler angle, gisand angle, is an important tool whenever we are dealing with calcaneal fractures. Another view which is very important in calcaneus is axial or Harris view. That's how we take it, the axial view, and that's how it looks like on the x-ray. So to illustrate, here on your right side is a case of calcaneal fracture which has been fixed internally, and you can see that by doing an internal fixation, the heel width has been restored to normal, while on the left side, in a patient of bilateral calcaneal fracture, you can see a broadened heel in the axial view. So these kind of informations are obtained on the axial views or the Harris views of calcaneus. 
The evaluation of intra-articular fracture of calcaneus now is incomplete without the help of a CT scan. So when we get the CT scan then you get such large, so many films. So what you got to see in these? Well, what you have to see is the pattern of the injury, knowing your sustentacular fragment, knowing your tuberosity fragment. And these kind of analysis are helpful in planning the treatment, in classifying your injuries. The classification nowadays being followed is based on CT scan. And this is Sanders classification type one to four, which is based on the coronal view in the broadest part of the talus. And you have these classification into type one, type two, type three, and type four, depending upon the fracture lines, which are present on the calcaneal sides. Next is the talus fracture. The lateral view of the uh, hind foot is able to tell us the different patterns of talus fractures, and they have been classified Hawkin type one to type four, depending upon whether the fracture is displaced or undisplaced, or whether it is uh, dislocated ankle joint or dislocated talonavicular as well as uh, ankle joint. So just a broad overview of these talus fractures, Hawkin classification. The important thing in TELUS is to know that there exists a special view called canal view. Canal view is a view which shows you the TELUS in full profile and is very helpful in assessment of your reduction as we do this fluoroscopic examination of the TELUS peroperatively and we check our reduction that have we been able to reduce our TELUS well. So, a simple post-operative examination by x-ray sometimes doesn't give you a very good information on how good your reduction is, but a CT scan assessment tells you that, yes, you have been able to reduce your talus quite well, and the, the shape is restored, the subtalar joint and ankle joint are looking good. So CT assessment post-operatively and pre-operatively, both for these kind of community talus injury becomes very important. Hind foot pain in a case of unresolved sprain is often due to tarsal coalition. So what you see here is a, is a, a calcaneo-navicular coalition. The calcaneal anterior process is continuous with the navicular by a bony segment, and this is called calcaneo-navicular coalition. You can see it clearly in uh, AP views, oblique views, and a subtle kind of calcaneal uh, tarsal coalition is better seen on an MRI in the form of edema in the region of uh, anterior process of calcaneus and by this peaking of talus at the talonavicular joint. Another important uh, examination tool to understand whether in a standing position, the heel is central, right under the tibia, or is it in varus or valgus, is a Salzman view in standing position. So this more or for less uh, summarizes what all we need to see in the hind foot. And we go on to the midfoot. In midfoot, we always order AP, lateral and oblique views. And what we see, we want to see that the medial border of the uh, first metatarsal is well aligned to the medial border, uh, lateral border uh, of the uh, first medial cuneiform. And similarly, we want to see the medial border of second metatarsal is well aligned to the medial border of the middle cuneiform. And then we are also looking at the fourth metatarsal medial border well aligned to the cuboid and third metatarsal well aligned to the lateral cuneiform. So these alignments, why, why do we need to see them? Because the subtle kind of midfoot injuries, so-called less frank injuries, which bring about disruption of these alignments are understood only once we make our eyes getting used to seeing these alignments. So here you can see in a less frank injury, the alignment is disturbed. 
the alignment of the fourth is disturbed. So this is a less frank injury. And very subtle less frank injuries, you have to look into the medial cuneiform, second metatarsal space, and look for this flake sign, which is suggestive of a less frank ligament injury. The other bit foot injury, you can clearly see, of course, all the metatarsal injuries, but what is more important is not to miss a Jones fracture, a Jones fracture non-union, because this is the place where the fracture is very likely to go into delayed and non-union, and then you can watch the progress of the fixation, whether your fracture has got united or not. And then we come to forefoot. In forefoot, we prefer to take again a standing x-ray, and the first metatarsophalangeal joint is the most often uh, subjected to osteoarthritic changes because in, in our toe push-off, 80% of the body weight is carried by the first MTP joints. And appearance of these dorsolateral osteophytes is a very early sign of early osteoarthritis of the first MTP joint. We also call this condition as hallux rigidus, and this is visible both on the lateral and the AP views. And once the disease advances, you can see the complete obliteration of the first MTP joint space, and these are late stage three hallux rigidus cases. This is one of the x-rays of a gouty arthritis, which again involves the first MTP joint. You can see a lot of gouty cysts in the head of the metatarsal. Hallux valgus, or the bunion, these are another areas where the standing x-rays are very important, weight-bearing x-rays are very important for the assessment. And we try to calculate the, the axis of the proximal phalanx and the axis of the metatarsal and the angle substituted by them. Normally, it should not be more than 15 degrees, but if it is more than that, we know that it is a hallux valgus. And depending upon the degree of the hallux valgus angle, and then measuring another intermetatarsal axis, the metatarsal axis of first and second, which normally should be nine. So based on these two parameters, we classify our hallux valgus into mild, moderate, and severe varieties. So whenever you do hallux valgus, you have a case, you should be able to measure these two angles and describe the severity of hallux valgus. Weight-bearing x-rays, lateral view of the foot. It's so very important in most of the deformities, whether you are dealing with cavus deformity, whether you're dealing with flat foot deformities. So this is how we do a weight-bearing x-rays of the foot and a take a lateral view. And what all we see? Sinus tarsi, of course. What is sinus tarsi? Well, it is a small opening uh, of the uh, tarsal tunnel lying just anterior to the uh, distal fibula. And uh, we can see here, the, this is how a small opening should be seen in a normal x-ray. But if the heel has gone into valgus in a pronated foot, this gets almost obliterated. And if the heel has gone into varus, you see a a big hole and you see an open sinus tarsi. So that's how looking at sinus tarsi, you get an idea whether you are dealing with heel varus or heel valgus. Another important thing, talar inclination angle on the weight bearing. So this is a talar inclination angle, which is very important to give you an indication whether you are handling a ankle impingement, or you are handling a malunited calcaneus in which the uh, talar inclination reduces from the normal of 20 to 26 degree. So uh, this is how you get an idea about the range of motion happening at the ankle and the impingement happening at the ankle by knowing your talar inclination. And then, there are other, other parameters like calcaneal inclination or the page, the Mary angle, so-called 
an access between the talus and the first metatarsal, local cranial angle, chyma, navicular cuboid overlap. These all, these all parameters you have to understand. I mean, because of paucity of time, I can't go into details of each and everything, but they are important tools in assessment of various deformities of the feet. I will just uh, cover a very commonly happening hyperpronated or the flat feet where how do these parameters change in these? So if you see these hyperpronated feet, the telos second metatarsal angle, which normally should be 16 degree, is found to be increased in this case. Similarly, the Mary angle, which normally should be about zero to four degree, is also increased in these cases. So my dear friends, a lot might be missing, but the time I think is over. And I'm hopeful that I've touched upon the basics that a postgraduate should know, and we'll have another occasion to talk more about radiology. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kamal. That was a great uh, informative lecture. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, uh, yeah. Ora, you want, uh, you want At present, I don't have questions, so you can generate a... Okay. A okay, Dr. Jha, if, if he wants to uh, add something. Otherwise, I can go ahead with certain things. Uh, Dr. Dureja, can I ask a very basic question? I'm Dr. Yes, Sharp. Sir. Yeah. Dr. Dureja? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, please go yes, on. Yeah. Like, we keep talking about weight bearing films. Practically, yeah. in the x ray room, it becomes very difficult. I mean, uh, whether you pay the patient stand on a table or on a high stool or on the, it's not possible to bring the uh, tube to the ground. Uh, an obese elderly patient, it becomes difficult to make them climb somewhere. How do I mean, go about these uh, weight bearing films uh, conveniently in an uh, extra room? So, uh, you're right, uh, it is difficult, but then it is not impossible. You, we have to uh, nowadays, you know, we have special kind of uh, uh, platforms made to, you know, uh, understand these things. I mean, we have special platforms for that. In a routine, in a routine X-ray room, I mean, it's not possible for you to go every time to an X-ray room and try to get it done with the radiographer. I mean, the radiographer has to do it as a routine. So do we? Have yeah, a... yeah. Uh, you you have to first, uh, you know, tune your radiographers that you want them, and you have to make them understand the importance of all these things. And then I hope you can, they can manage it. You know, they can sometimes even make the patient stand on the uh, normal X-ray machine and take that way. So I, I don't find it difficult once you make the radiographer understand or you provide them a special platform on which the patient stands and then they are able to perform these X-rays. Okay. Okay. Any, anybody else wants to comment yeah. on that? Though? So I can add a few things uh, uh, in examination. Uh, the certain thing in uh, potent ankle, particularly in the fracture uh, treatment planning, I think CT is almost a must. It is just like uh, any other uh, diaphyseal injury or periarticular injury. Where uh, in, uh, it is not like a diaphyseal fracture where you can assess all the displacements and the and the sizes uh, right from the X-rays. So one should be prepared to look into CT in most of the cases of the trauma of foot and ankle. Then coming to the two most common presentations in our clinics is basically you see one is the lateral ligament injury and the other is the midfoot sprain. So when you look into a lateral ligament injuries and midfoot sprains, you find very subtle signs which you have to look. There are many common fractures which are fixed, like anterior process of the calcaneus you can have. Then you can have a lateral process of the talus. So you have to be very, very uh, you know, attentive towards these injuries. You should know what injuries you are looking for. And similarly, in the midfoot sprain, what Dr. Dureja showed uh, as a low uh, energy uh, or uh, Liz Frank injuries, you can have even subtle avulsion fractures of the cuboid, of the navicular, or of the talus. So the, one should have these things in mind, when particularly when you are looking for uh, any sprain. So you don't miss these fractures and the avulsion fractures. 
And then the other thing is when you're requesting for an investigation, particularly an MRI, we need to provide what actually we are looking for. It's very, most of the time we have the habit of telling MRI foot and ankle. This doesn't work. Particularly when, when the, the radiologist who is doing this investigation doesn't have any idea where he should look for. So, so this is uh, what I, I, I have to uh, say that uh, uh, in these patients, particularly when you're getting an MRI done, you should tell the patient, let's, let's say if you are looking a chronic uh, instability patient, you have to tell, it is not only that you are looking into the lateral ligament, you are looking into peroneal tendons, you are looking into osteochondral lesion. So you should mention uh, to the MRI specialist that I'm looking into so that he can concentrate there. He, he, he have an idea what he's looking. If the patient is presenting with the correlation symptom, then he should have. So that is a few points which I would I think, make. yeah, absolutely, sir. Very important point. Basically, we need to make a specific diagnosis first, communicate that with the radiologist, and uh, also, as Dr. Kamal said, basically we need to uh, uh, train our uh, radiologists, uh, the radiographers about the views, that different views. So we really have to train them. And there's a special step sort of platform which you can get made, a wooden platform, which you can use that, you know, to increase the height and make it easy for the patient to go up on a height. Uh, and that, that sometimes we use in our setting. Uh, Dr. Jha, sir, you wanted to say something? So you are muted. We can't hear you. All right. So the very first thing, as you have rightly said, you have to have special steps in foot and ankle radiology room. And if you keep on attending various international conferences, you will find that the special CT scans have, are also there for foot and ankle. And uh, so foot and ankle radiology is altogether a different ball game. And I will say that trauma again, like other trauma in orthopedic field, you have to span, scan and plan. So you have to get an instant x-ray and maybe you will like to go for another x-ray when you have spanned the joint. And as rightly Dr. Rajiv has said that CT scan and sometimes MRI are invariably there. Now, one another point that I wanted to focus was that in cases of diseases of the foot or Patients with anatomical or mechanical uh, instability of the foot, you have always to compare and it, you should compare it from the contralateral foot. Number, uh, something in the last I would like to draw attention is the external rotation and internal rotation of the tibia which can make a difference. Like if I say that if you dorsiflex a foot, the tibia goes into internal rotation, the heel goes into vulgus. So it will make a difference if the patient has a flat foot. So to make it common, it is advisable that both the limbs should be kept in 30 degree of flexion at the knee and then the x-ray of the foot and ankle is to be taken. So that will give an equal dynamic force to both the ankle and foot. Uh, Thank you, sir. I think that's a really important uh, learning point there. Uh, now we move on to the interesting part of our uh, Discussion. Uh, now, I'm, may I invite Dr. Alok Sud to give his talk on short case of club foot. Dr. Alok Sud, sir. Just can share your screen. Hello. Uh, are you able to see the screen? Hello. 
Yes, sir, we can hear you, but slightly, it's, the, it's not very clear. All right. Is it okay now? Uh, slightly better, but it was better before. Just a minute. Yeah. Yeah. So, good evening, everybody. I hope I'm clear now, right? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, we'll be taking up a short case of Clubfoot, right? So, uh, at the outset, I, I, I must tell all the postgraduate students who are listening to the talk, that although we know the diagnosis over here, and we will also know the diagnosis when you are given a short case of clear foot, you will know when, when you see the patient, don't jump onto the diagnosis, right? Go systematically, there will be many hidden caveats, right, which might be waiting for you, and therefore, please do not make a pre-diagnosis of clear foot whenever you get a case. So go systemically, and in which the history is very important. Now, what is the point? What are the important points of history? Besides Can you share your screen? Uh, oh, yeah. Not, uh, are you not able to see? No, we cannot see, sir. Are you able to see now? Uh, no. Now? Yes, we can see it now, sir. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the important things in the history, uh, besides demographics and contact details, uh, which are required for the follow up are the obstetric history and the family history. Uh, prior treatment history, if there is any, is important, and any other apparent abnormalities or problems should be asked, which are pointed by the parents uh, in, the, in, the, in the examination room. Now the examination, it begins not with the foot. It begins with the rest of the musculoskeletal system. Besides musculoskeletal system, if there are obvious uh, markers, then you must ask, then you must examine the chest, the CVS, and rest of the systems. Now, as far as the musculoskeletal system is concerned, you must systematically move from spine to the lower limbs. As far as spine is concerned, please check for source or tear, etc., to indicate spinal bifida or any curvature abnormalities. In hips, look for a uh, dysplastic hip. Do neurological examination if, uh, if required. Or if the child is too small, ask parents about vision impairment, intellectual impairment, or developmental delays, which will tell you uh, things about uh, diagnosis. And in the last, check for the upper and lower extremities for all joints for full range of motion, contractures, and muscle pain. Right? Be systematic in your examination. Now, as far as the local examination is concerned, as was pointed out by Dr. Chha, it has to proceed in, uh, in this fashion and only in this fashion. It begins with inspection, palpation, followed by deformity and range of motion, measurements, and neurology whenever applicable. Now, it all starts with inspection, and you start inspection as soon as the patient walks in, if he's in the walking age. If the patient is brought into the clinic by the parents, you must inspect the patient on the lap of the mother, making him comfortable or on the examination table, wherever the child is not crying. The inspection has to be done from all sides. That means dorsolectorally, posteriorly, medially, and from the plantar aspect. Right? Now, when a case of a club foot, idiopathic club foot will come to you, you will generally see the patient. You will start examination from the dorsolateral aspect. Now, from the dorsolateral aspect, you can see that the child, the, that the foot is being shaped, a concave inner border, a convex outer border, a atrophied skin is present, with multiple creases over here, right? Then the lateral malleolus, if you see posteriorly, the lateral malleolus is more prominent as compared to the medial malleolus. The heel is small and inconspicuous. In, in it is very sized. It is lying in the varus, right? And above over here, the tendriculus is there, which is small and contracted. On the medial border, the medial border is concave. You can see cavus. You will see two clefts, two creases, one deep crease over here, and another deep crease just above the posterior aspect of the heel. Now, the presence of these creases are very much pathognomic of an idiopathic club foot. Therefore, you must see for these things. If the patient is in walking gait, you must see for calopsis. Now, inspection is followed by palpation. Now, irrespective of the organ what you are palpating, it must uh, be systematic. 
and temperature, tenderness, swelling, and callosity, and alignment, alignment must be seen. Now, where to see? The points which are to be palpated, they include bony prominences, including the malleoli, the lateral head of the talus, the borders, the heel, the tendons which are contracted, like tender Achilles, and uh, uh, sometimes we will also uh, palpate for the tendons of tibialis anterior and tibialis posterior. And very important, you must see the extent of correction while you are palpating. This is followed by deformity and range of motion. We already know that a club foot has a deformity of equinus at the ankle joint, right? You can see the equinus. At subtalar joint, it is varus, right? If you see posteriorly, the heel is inverted. At midfoot, there is adduction. And at forefoot, there is pronation, right? Now, how does pronation occur is that the hind foot, it lies in supination. The forefoot is in relative pronation. And because forefoot is in relative pronation, that is why the first metatarsal, it falls down as compared to the rest of the metatarsals resulting in cave. So this results in the famous uh, uh, acronym of cave, that is cavus, adduction, uh, varus, and equinus, right? So range of motion, we know the deformities. So deformity means that the movement in the opposite side is not present. So if there is plantar flexion at the ankle and it is deformed in plantar flexion, that means dorsal flexion will be absent. Right. Similarly, there will be no valgus at the uh, or no eversion at the subtalar joint. There will be no abduction at the midfoot, and there will be no uh, supination at the forefoot. Right. So all these deformities are present, and that is why correction is not fully there, and that is why it is called for idiopathic club. Now, it makes sense over here that when the child is in walking gait, you can see the movements while making the child walk, and while making the child walk and stand on toes as well as on heels, right? Measurements. Now, measurements are important. They may not be very important in a small child where there is a idiopathic club foot, but they may become important when the child is suffering from a secondary club foot, right? When it is a neurological or a syndromic club foot. So do not forget to uh, measure the leg, the whole of the lower limb, ipsilateral as well as contralateral, the calf girl, and obviously the foot from back of heel to the tip of great toe. Now, as far as imaging is concerned, the imaging is not necessary for making a diagnosis in a case of idiopathic blood flow, right? Imaging is done only in special conditions, right? One of the conditions is failure of a non-operative treatment, right? When the non-operative treatment or conservative treatment has failed, we want to do some operative intervention. And that is where you want to take an X-ray so that you confirm the residual deformity and their magnitude. Second, a recurrent deformity, right? Again, before planning the uh, operative management. Third, you have to take an X-ray after correction of uh, after the correction of deformity by operative management to see whether these uh, deformities have been fully corrected or not. And lastly, you must take uh, the X-rays in an atypical secondary or feet which are unusually resistant to non-operative standard treatment that is consequence treatment. Right. So, what X-rays do you take in these children? Right. In non ambulatory children, you take an anteroposterior view and a lateral view in stress loss of direction. In an ambulatory child, you have to take an anteroposterior view and a lateral view in a standing position. Again, as the discussion was being generated, for an older child, you can take a step and make the child stand so that his foot height is comparable to the height of the extra view. Now, before we see the x-rays, we must know the ossification centers. Now, the ossification centers for the calcaneus, the talus, and cuboid, and the metatarsal shafts, they generally appear before birth. You can see in this x-ray, this is lateral. This is the ossification center for calcaneus. This is medial ossification center for talus. Cuboid has still not appeared because generally, the ossification center appearance in a club deformity is delayed. Over here, the cuboid also, has also appeared. Out of the tarsus, navicular is the last to appear which appears after around three to four years. You can see in this child, talus, calcaneus, cuboid, and nebicule. So this child is at least three to four years of age, right? So once you know these ossification centers, then we can proceed to the rest of the imaging. Now, what do we see on an imaging, right? On an AP view, you see the talocalcanean relationship, right? In a lateral view also, talocalcanean relationship is the most important angle, right? 
Besides, there are several other angles which are described. I have taken which are important. The relationship between the talus and the first metatarsal. Right? Uh, if the navicular is present, then how much navicular is covering the, uh, the talar head? That should be seen. On a lateral view, besides talocalcanian relationship, we can include the tibiocalcanian angle. Right? And lastly, there is a telocalcanian index, which is generally asked in the exams, which is also called Kites index, which is addition of the AP and lateral tight angle. It should be more than 40 degrees in corrected level. So these are the normal values. A AP telocalcanian angle should be 30 to 55 degrees, a lateral telocalcanian 25 to 50 degrees. A telo first metatarsal angle is generally 5 to 15 degrees. If the first metatarsal is falling medial to the talus, the angle goes into negative, that is less than zero degree. Similarly, a tibiocalcanian angle normally should be 10 to 40 degrees. However, when it is an equinus, that means dorsiflexion is not present, it again goes into negative. On the whole, the principle is that there is parallelism is seen in between talus and calcaneus in both views in a case of plateau. Just look at these long axes. This is talus, this is calcaneus. They do not cross each other. This is a case of plateau. Whereas in this case, which is normal, right? This is long axis of the talus. This is long axis of the calcaneus. They cross each other. Similarly, in an AP view, right? They are divergent, right? So these divergent views are open scissors. Whereas these convergent views or parallel views are closed scissors. So closed scissoring, it happens in club foot and open scissoring, it happens in a normal foot. So diagnosis. So once you have examined and you have finished the foot, the next question which will be asked in the exam will be, what is your diagnosis, right? Or when you have said your diagnosis, they may ask you, what is a idiopathic club foot or a CTEV, right? So there are many prevalent definitions. So this is a definition which is simple and easy to remember and it covers almost all aspects of the idiopathic club foot. That is the congenital cavus, adductus, varus and equinus. That is a cave deformity of the foot which is not completely corrected passive, right? So it is non-controversial uh, definition and it covers all aspects of the idiopathic club foot. So once you have defined, you have told the examiner that what is your diagnosis, you have also defined it. Now the examiner will definitely ask you, why do you call it an idiopathic club foot and why don't you call it any other club foot? Now the answer to this question is, is relative, but you have to answer this question objectively. So the objective answer should be that it is a characteristic bean-shaped deformity in an otherwise normal child. Uh, otherwise normal is important over here because otherwise normal means that the child is not suffering from any neurological or syndromic condition. That means you have ruled out a secondary club foot. So this becomes a idiopathic club foot. It is present since birth. The history will tell you. There is a deep medial crease and there is a deep cleft or crease just above the posterior fibrosity of the heel. Now, in a normal foot, you will see that there are, there are several fine creases over here. These several fine creases form because in utero, the child is able to dorsiflex the foot and plantar flex the foot. Now, since this is a deformity in plantar flexion, the child was never able to dorsiflex his foot in utero. That is why these stretching marks or these fine creases were never formed in this foot. So, this is one of the most important findings which you will find in an idiopathic club foot, which you will not find in an acquired club. Besides that, calf atrophy and hypoplasia of the axilateral limb will nail the diagnosis as far as clinically is concerned. So what are the differential diagnoses? I'm sure the examiner is going to ask you this, right? So you can, you have to differentially diagnose your idiopathic club foot from several other conditions, right? Which are based on the cause, like a postural club foot, a metatarsus adductus, atypical club foot, secondary and stupid. Till gradually come cover one by one. Now what is an idiopath what is a postural club foot? Right? Postural club foot means that it looks like a club foot, but actually it is not a club foot. So uh, actually there is no deformity. You will be able to correct the foot fully. That means you will be able to achieve a dorsiflexion which is much more than 15 degrees. Right? Although the foot appears to be a club foot, the foot is normal in shape and size and there will be no calf atrophy and hypoplasia of the length. Idiopathic versus metatarsus adductus, right? Now, what is metatarsus adductus? It is basically uh, a condition where the hind foot and midfoot are normal. Yeah, there are no deformities in the hind foot and midfoot. 
However, the forfeit shows reduction of variable degree, right? So you will be able to see a forfeit reduction, but there is no favors and there is no equinus deformity when you will examine the problem. Idiopathic versus atypical. Now, this atypical club foot came into picture only once we started doing concerti. It was defined by con concerti as a short chubby foot with a cocked up great toe, right? With a deep midfoot crease, right? You can see this crease, which can be also visible laterally. This is called, this complete falling off all the five toes is called not cavus. It is called plantaris deformity. Cavus means falling off only the first metatarsal. When all the five metatarsals fall, they are called plantaris deformity. And there is severe equinus. According to Ponsetti, right, this was the pathogenesis of this deformity. So what has happened is that there was a short and chubby foot to begin with, and you applied a plaster, a Ponsetti cast. Now, instead of holding, the toes disappeared and the foot slipped proximally inside the cast. So that heel reached here instead of sitting here, and that resulted into a fixed severe equinus. That the same mechanism results in popping up of the great toe. And once you remove the cast, even after seven days, what results is an atypical foot. However, controversy exists. Many of us have found an atypical foot to be present even without application of the first cast. Idiopathic versus secondary. Now, secondary feet are very important, right? You have to examine rest of the body and neurology as well as vascular uh, vascularity of the distal limbs to differentiate in between idiopathic and secondary club, right? Now, they, the, common, the common causes are spina bifida, cerebral palsy has now taken over then PPRP as PPRP is gradually vanishing and other neurological deficits like a sharpfoot medical disease. So you will find telltale marks like a spina bifida, like, like a spina bifida, like an ulcer, right? In a patient of cerebral palsy, in, if, the, if the child is older, you will find all the telltale signs of spastic cerebral palsy. In syndromic, what comes to us uh, more often is arthrogryposis, a congenital band syndrome, and tibial hemimelia and other syndromes, which you will be able to uh, find out if you have done a good systemic examination. And that is why a good systematic examination is important to rule out a secondary clubfoot. That is why I told you that please do not jump on the diagnosis of idiopathic clubfoot as soon as you get a case, right? Because that will block the rest of the mental thoughts. Idiopathic versus skew foot. Now, skew foot is something uh, which is also called a Z feet, Z foot, where there is varus or forefoot adduction in the forefoot, adduction in the forefoot, and there is valgus of the heel in the hind foot. It is usually iatrogenic. We will go into this later on. Now, sometimes the examiner might ask you what is the pathonatomy or soft tissue contracture, right? Now, please do not get bowled over in this position because it is too much material to learn, right? So what you do is that you visualize the foot in your mind, right? The deformity of the foot in your mind. Whatever is there on the posterior side, both medially as well as lateral is contracted, right? So what is present on the posterior side? Tendoachylus, right? The capsule of the ankle joint, the capsule of the subtalar joint, the calcaneal fibular ligament. On the medial side, the deltoid ligament, the spring ligament, the capsule of the telonavicular joint, and on medial side again, tibialis posterior, FDL, I mean flexor distal longus and flexor helices longus, and where they cross over, they form a Henry's knot, right? So please do not get bowled over by this, right? Now coming to the plantar surface, right? What is what will be contracted is whatever is in between the talus and calcaneum, right? That is telocalcaneum interosseous ligament a bifurcate biligament, plantar aponeurosis. So, so therefore, what I want to say is that even if you do not remember all the structures, it does not, it does not matter, right? If you remember the deformity in your mind, you will be able to answer logically. So a logical answer is more important than an absurd answer. Classification. Now, classification actually does not matter we usually classify it into a severe or rigid foot or a mild and supple foot, right? By definition, a short and stubby foot, which is rigid on manipulation with a short first metatarsal and cocked up great toe is called a rigid foot, right? So whenever you uh, are examining a patient of idiopathic club foot, please try to correct the deformity, manipulate and correct the deformity gently, right? 
So if it is resistant, then most likely with these features, then most likely it's a rigid foot. On the other hand, if it is a longer, less rigid foot, supple, and it is pliable to manipulate, and great toe is normal, it is most commonly, more commonly it will be a supple or mild variety. Now, besides classification, you have to evaluate. Whereas classification tells us the cause and the treatment stage, evaluation will objectively tell us what is the suppleness, right? Not only that, it will also tell us the effectiveness of treatment and it predicts the time for treatment, right? So one of the more com most common methods which is available to us for evaluation is Pirani's method. Those of us who run a CTV clinic or those of us who treat CTV, we know how to do Pirani's. It is a very easy method, quick method, very objective, right? And very less intra-observable differences. So there are eight that the Pirani, the original Pirani, it started with 10 points, but what we practiced in the clinic are just six points, three hind foot contracture points and three mid foot contracture points, right? Let's go side, let's go consecutively. So this is a curved lateral border. What you place is a rigid uh, object along the lateral border of the foot without doing any correction. This is the only parameter which is done without uh, pr uh, producing a passive correction, right? So when whole of the foot is aligning with this rigid object, it is zero. When only the uh, the, uh, the proximal part of the foot is aligning with it, and the forefoot is not aligning with this rigid object, object it is one. So the medial crease, right? There is absence of crease on on uh, full correction. There is partial appearance of the crease. There is full deep crease present over here. So this is one. This is one side. This is zero. Similarly, a posterior a uh, 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 crease, right? You can see these multiple creases over here. The, that single deep crease is not there. So this is zero, whereas a single deep crease is present over here. So this is one. The reducibility of the lateral head, right? You will see with the help of one toe while you're abducting the rest of the foot, right? If it gets uh, reduced fully, it is zero. And if it doesn't get reduced at all, this is the uncovered head of the lateral talus. Uh, uh, uncovered lateral part of the head of the talus, which is not reduced completely. So this is one, this is getting reduced completely, this is zero. Empty heel. Empty heel, you will palpate the posterior tuberosity of the heel in full correction. If you are able to palpate the heel as in the other foot, it becomes zero. If you are unable to palpate it as a soft spot, it becomes one. Rigid equinus. Rigid equinus is usually palpated with the knee in extension and ideally should be seen from the lateral side. So with knee in extension, if you are able to extend or dorsiflex beyond 90, beyond neutral, it becomes zero. If, if, you, if you are able to do it, it becomes one. So this is in short the Pirani's method. There are other evaluation methods more difficult, right, but more object objective. They are uh, they can also be utilized. One of them is the Demeglio method, right? So generally speaking, in a small child, we use a Pirani's method. In a bigger child who is able to walk, we use the Demeglio method. So this is generalization. Now, once we have classified and we have also evaluated the case, the next thing is how will you manage, right? So management will differ in a neonate as well as in a non-walking child. So management, all of us know it starts with quantity, right? Because it is the it is the method which, which has low relapse, it is quicker, it has reduced the requirement of surgery in club foot to almost none. We are not doing any more surgery in club foot now, and it is effective even in neglected resistance syndrome. But the treatment starts with counseling. So always say this in, in the in, in the exam that you have to do parent counseling. You have to tell the parents about the next child, if they are if they are planning the next uh, ne next child birth, about about uh, chances of getting a club foot in the next child, right? And before you send him for treatment, you have to manipulate, right? While you are examining and palpating, you have to manipulate and see its uh, its reducibility, right? So the serial task it's type it starts as soon as the patient presents to the clinic. Frequency is normally seven days. And the tasks are applied till we achieve an abduction of 60 to 70 degrees. So a PCT, that is percutaneous stenotomy, is usually done after we have completely corrected the midfoot score and the hindfoot score is generally less than or equal to one. So understanding constantly, right? Now, if you look at this, this figure, right? So this figure shows you that the hindfoot is in supination, the forefoot is in pronation. 
and because the forefoot is in pronation that is why the first ray drops now imagine if you pronate this foot right if you consider whole foot as supinated and you pronate the whole foot you will not be correcting the foot you will be just exaggerating the tail because the more you will pull this metatarsus up the fifth metatarsal up that is pronate the more the first metatarsal will go down so the first step in pomsity method is elevation of the first metatarsal right that is correction of the pronation of the forefoot that is you supinate the forefoot so although you the it, it seems that you are exaggerating the deformity but actually you are bringing the first metatarsal in line with the rest of the metatarsal so number 1 never pronate because that will increase tears not only it will increase tears it will lock the forefoot in a deformity you will not be able to bring that foot out of that deformity the second point once the first metatarsal lies at the level of rest of the metatarsals now you can abduct gradually placing your thumb on the lateral head of the talus so use lateral head of talus as a fulcrum and abduct this foot around this lateral head of the talus now you will see that as soon as you have started to abduct the forefoot the heel automatically goes into valgus you don't have to do anything for the heel so the second point is the heel should never be held right if you will heel uh, if you will hold the heel in your hand you will be just abducting this and you will block the free movement of valgus of the heel by which the heel will correct automatically so there are two no's in it right never pronate and never hold the heel so this is what uh, the lifting of the first metatarsal was called the golden or the magic move right we have already discussed it once we have done that you have to just gradually abduct it till you achieve abduction of 60 to 70 degrees this is followed by a four foot in snot right so i'm not going into detail because you have you or you have already read about quantity management but this is important these these steps are important in the examination right so pct is done to achieve a uh a, 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 a dorsiflexion of around 10 to 15 degrees now bracing the bracing has to be done with the help of a foot abduction bar or which is also called a steam lift brace it is applied 23 hours a day initially for the first few months setting one hour for cleaning right after three months the foot abduction is a uh, foot abduction bar is applied only during sleeping time for a minimum and it is continued for a minimum of four years there are no walking shoes which are required right so it is important to understand that the bracing confines only in a idiopathic left foot confines only to a foot abduction bar nothing else right so some questions may be asked regarding the regarding the uh, the casting technique why a long leg cast why not a short leg cast yes a long leg cast is necessary because the required external rotation and abduction which is required in a pomsity method can only be held by a above knee long leg cast right if you will be applying a short leg cast although there are papers now on that also you will not be you, you will be defeating your purpose of achieving this much abduction right second it prevents cast slippage and the knee position is definitely 90 degree until unless it is some other conditions they dictate to they they differ the position of the knee now a word on difference between dennis brown spring most of you might not have seen many of you might not have seen a steam big brace under dennis brown spring and you might be confusing in between the two so dennis brown spring is nothing the cross bar which the foot plates at 20 degrees the principle is that the kicking action of the knee will stretch the the tendon achilles which will result in the correction of the deformity so originally a dennis brown spring was used for correction of the deformity as well as for holding the deformity now the difference over here is that it steel big brace the cross bar is there right which is not straight which is curved right and the foot plates are at 60 to 70 degree of abduction which is necessary to hold the foot in that because we achieved that in the last class right the abduction prevents the relapse of the deformity and that is why it is very important now this steel big brace is never used for correction of the deformity it is just used to hold the deformity right so that must be clear in the uh, when whenever you speak with cases so potential complications are obviously or hypogenic right one of the common deformities one of the common complications are rocker, rocker bottom foot what happens is that you are just dorsiflexing this forefoot right and there are unending soft tissue structures over there so what you do is that you produce a break at the midfoot right and it becomes a boat shaped a convex medial border foot instead of a normal arched foot 
right? Other complications are obviously tight plasters, right? Sores, pain because of trauma and callosities, calf atrophy because of repeated uh, plasters, and sometimes stress factors. Now it is imperative over here to mention a word about Kites method, right? Now this Kites method, it it was the celebrated method before actually Fonseca came, right? But the crux of the difference is that the fulcrum of the correction was at the calcaneal pivot point, right? In Fonseca method, the fulcrum is the lateral part of the head of the thallus. In Kite, it is the calcaneal pivot point. When you the fulcrum is at calcaneal pivot point, you hold the heel. As, as it is held in this diagram. And once you are holding the heel, you block the valorization of the heel with the abduction of the foot. So that was, uh, the holding uh, of the heel was called kites error. So anyway, so we are not using kites method anymore now because of all these problems. And that is why quantity method is being used. The other successful, equally successful method is French functional physiotherapy method, which is not practiced in India probably because it is difficult for uh, uh, for us to do manipulation daily at home, temporarily in between uh, the functional physiotherapy, and as they take in this gun, uh, so as to hold the uh, deformed direction. Now there are a few nomenclatures. That is, these are the classifications which are based on the uh, on the treatment state of the club foot, right? According to that, it might be persisting deformity. That means it was never fully corrected. A relapsed and recurrent club foot is one where the deformity recurs or worsens after correction. Right? A resistant club foot should ideally be that which does not get corrected by a standard method of correction. However, it has been defined by Ponsky as even after application of three serial Ponsky casting, when you do not see improvement on scoring, it is called, it is labeled a resistant club foot. Now, there, there might be some controversy on the nomenclatures, but these are the most acceptable uh, definitions. A neglected club foot is one is one when the treatment is starting started after the child has become ambulatory. In other words, it can also be a club foot. Uh, a, a neglected club foot is also an untreated club foot in an older child. And lastly, a complex club foot. Whenever a club foot is treated with methods other than quantity, they may have residual deformities and scarings, and these are called complex club feet. Now, uh, although I have defined all these. There might be uh, controversies in this, and many different authors might uh, tend to differ. My, many different examiners they might tend to differ, right? So let's do a, a quick go through a neglected club foot, right? Now this child is a bigger child. This child will come to you walking, so you start examination with the gait, right? Besides asking demographics and family history, ox history, you have to examine the child systematically. So always start from the spine, hips, do examine the knee, the contralateral limb, and always proceed in that. See the severity of the deformity. The child might be painful on walking because now he has developed a velocity. Now, most important thing is that the parents have brought this child to you now at this stage is because he's unable to wear a normal footwear. And that's, that leads to uh, ostracism, right? And that is the reason why this child is now brought. Besides that, the parents might also think about thin legs, short feet, and you must ask about the previous attempts of treatment with any. Now, imaging, as usual, is a must in a neglected foot, right? As I told you that there will be parallelism in between talus and tilting, right? So sometimes you are able to get a good view in a neglected foot, but sometimes the foot is uncorrectable. You might be just uh, doing an extra just for the sake of the call. Differential diagnosis is important in neglected club foot. Secondary causes have to be ruled out. How do you rule out? By presence of scar, that is a telltale uh, uh, treatment effect, a ulcer. When the child is walking or when the child has spina bifida, neurological problems, sensory problems might develop an ulcer. Neurological examination in these children is a must. So you have to go uh, systematically and you must do imaging in this child. Now, I just included this image because the Parents might be telling you that we did not receive any treatment. But when you see such an image with a flat top talus, you know already that the child was treated somewhere, treated wrongly somewhere. Right? Now, treatment options. So once the treatment options for a neglected foot till at least the age of four years, right, has to be conservative. Quantity treats even children even at this age. And we have treated even 
older children as old as 10 years with quantity techniques successfully but there might be some uh, some residual uh, deformities which might remain after conservative management in such a old child for that you may have to do a uh, tela part approach surgery right if there is uh, some degree of equinus present you may have to do a percutaneous tenotomy or a semi open tenotomy when it when you think that it is not amenable to a percutaneous tenotomy and the posterior capsulotomy is done you must go uh, you must go for the formal open tibialis uh, uh, tendotibial lengthening plus minus posterior capsulotomy then the cavus part is more you might have to release the plantar fascia the stangulus procedure and sometimes when there is a uh, over supination you might have to do a tibialis anterior uh, tendon transfer right so if if tibialis anterior is overactive it pulls the forefoot into supination keeps the hind foot into varus so if you redistribute the power that is if you transfer this power laterally the the excessive pulling into supination will be prevented the other treatment options in a neglected club foot are extensive soft tissue release as uh, described by pma as described by telfo that is posterior medial release right what you do is in posterior medial release is that you release or lengthen everything which is present medially and posteriorly right and then you place the navicular in correct position through the talus fix it to the kvi and that is a posterior medial release a complete subtalar release is more an anatomical it is more uh, amenable with the poncity technique right so what you do is that you not only release medially and posteriorly you also release as i told you in the beginning that the structures on the lateral side are also contracted so you release medially posteriorly laterally and on the subtalar aspect right and then uh, the navicular is placed in correct position to the talus the cstr will be correct uh, dr alok sir can you please make it yeah. slightly short because we are running out of time all right okay so last two slides so other are bony procedures right that uh, the the lateral column is longer the medial column is shorter so you shorten the lateral column right you shorten the lateral column sometimes you might have to combine the shortening of the lateral column with lengthening of the medial column and sometimes when there is only one deformity present you might have to do just osteotomy of the heel and a word about external fixators right so when you, when you know how to apply external fixator uh, you place uh, you uh, distract posteriorly medially and uh, and posto medially and sometimes combined with osteotomy will produce a good uh, good correction similarly by just fixator say external fixator producing good correction triple arthrodesis is not done anymore because usually we are able to solve the problem other procedures include include supramedullary osteotomy and telecom right so summary is uh, is that in supination you can do the bellus anterior transfer in varus you can do lateral column shortening in intorsion supramedullary osteotomy all deformities can be corrected by external fixators this is theoretical thank you very much we can uh, okay. yeah thank you professor alok so there are yeah. couple of questions for you so uh, yeah. uh, dr manish one dr uh, manish i just need one question one, koi, i just Dr. Matthews, please be ready with your presentation. And Dr. Vineet, please you can ask your question. Yeah, uh, Dr. Alok, uh, thanks for nice presentation. And I think you have got most of the things in the club foot. Our children, our students must have got a clear idea about it, how to treat. Uh, I just want to tell one thing. Uh, when you are mentioning about atypical and complex club foot, so I think both of them are having the same features, except that atypical is being from the since the time of birth, and complex is iatrogenically created. like when you are uh, mentioning that uh, slippage of cast is there so that leads to the deformity of uh, supple, supple foot and uh, uh, small, big uh, great toe and the deep medial crease that is what is a complex club foot do you so agree with that I, uh, so i would like to clarify number 1 there is controversy in the nomenclature number 2 as far as poncity is concerned poncity has given these two terms so according to him right when the cast right. slipped when, when the cast when you, when you mm. apply a good Good cast, quantity cast, right? In that cast, it slips. The foot slips. It results in severe equinus of the forefoot with cocking up of the great toe, right? That is actually a atypical club foot. He defined complex right. club foot arising out of uh, methods which were not, which are not in conformity with quantity's technique. So, if you treat club foot by any other method, like a by like former so-called kites method, or you have operated this club foot. 
and the deformity still remains. So probably in these kind of situations, the Ponsetti method will not work, work, right? In a typical club foot, modified Ponsetti method works. In an atypical club foot, modified Ponsetti method works. In a complex club foot, Ponsetti method will not work. That is why he has separated yeah. those two. But still there is controversy and uh, we can have, uh, you know, view of seniors sitting over here. Regarding yeah, I think Dr. Matthew, Dr. Matthew can more clarify because this is what we have uh, got information from Dr. Uh, Pirani itself. He has clarified that both are having the same features, but only the difference with that and both can be managed by the modified Ponsetti method itself. And the only difference is that uh, atypical is since the time of birth, which has not been treated, and complex is only idiogenically created yeah, atypical. As I told you in my talk, Dr. Also, Dr. Matthew can. Also, yeah. Ponsetti has described it because of slippage of the cast, but we have seen cases who have presented to us with atypical features even before a cast was applied. So, you know, it is a choice in between what, yeah, yeah, that is, what is your personal experience. Okay, uh, no. So, no. Dr. Matthews can have the word on this one. Dr. Manish, can I have a yes. word with Dr. Matthews about this one? Please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, Alok. Please. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, sir. Sorry, we can. My my bandwidth is not good. If I go on audio video, it may not work. Let me just see. Yeah. Let me am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. let me explain in two minutes the history of the word atypical. The term atypical was used in the original description of children that were getting treated by Ponsetti's method. And somewhere down on the they stopped getting corrected. So in a meeting on Clubfoot, where some of the stalwarts were there, at a dinner meeting, they shared this experience. You know, we have some children, it doesn't get corrected after casting. So one of them said, there is something atypical. So the expression atypical came from there. So my my internet is unstable. Can I put the video off? Yeah. yeah so yeah. the expression, the atypical yes, came from there. So in the early phase, in the entire 2000 to 2010, even up to 2015, this description was followed as discussed with Ponsetti himself that atypical is the one which is post casting slippage of the cast. But then there was confusion, and because of the confusion. They have normalized the nomenclature as, as because some of them saw many of the features of the atypical club foot, which is iatrogenic, are also seen in some children who have never had any treatment. De novo, de novo identical presentation, but a milder presentation. So to distinguish between the two, they started calling the de novo one as the atypical and the post cast one as the complex club. Ponsetti himself has used it interchangeably in some articles. So there is a description on this. The original description is what Dr. Alok is He's right on that. It was used, iatrogenic was atypical. But subsequently now, internationally, they are tending to use the term complex club foot for the iatrogenic and the atypical club foot for the de novo atypical features. So that is what Dr. Shafi Prani also clarified when he came last. Okay. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Right. Matthew, sir. Uh, Dr. Alok, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Of, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. There are a couple of questions from yeah, the sure. audience. I think yeah. we have to take them. One or two we'll take now yeah. and then we will go at the end. How to manage patients uh, who, who present with compensated tibial tor torsion due to neglected CTV? Should we do a derotational osteotomy? Now you have to see how the patient is presenting. Right. So the, the treatment is based upon the presentation. Most of the times you will not be you will not be uh, doing the tibial, uh, uh, tibial torsion, any osteotomy for tibial torsion. And when you have you have corrected the foot, the child will be, will be walking normally. But still, when uh, when there is uh, when you see that it is decompensated, the child is still walking on an indoing gait. Yes, you can do. But these cases are rare. Most okay. of the times you will not be doing any thing for the torsion. Uh, Professor Sood, what is the modified Ponsetti casting in complex club foot? See, uh, you will be able to understand it better if you are doing Ponsetti, right? So in Ponsetti, what we do is that we elevate the first metatarsal, that is the first 
first step and one once the first metatarsal is in alignment is that level with the rest of the metatarsals you start abducting it and you achieve abduction of around 60 to 70 degree so your pressure is only at the first metatarsal in complex clubfoot you have to apply pressure at the base uh, at the head of the first metatarsal as well as fifth one so you lift both together that is number one number two you do not aim for a very high abduction you just stop at around 40 degree number three you might have to do a tenotomy early in the procedure right so these are the three uh, modifications in quantity uh, to manage a atypical club uh, professor sood uh uh, for the there is a post graduate who wants to know what to say in the exam whether dennis brown splint or steenbeck brace which no, should we prefer now never dennis brown right it is always steenbeck brace with ponsity we are treating with ponsity we are not using dennis brown at all it is steenbeck brace and i told you uh, the differences in between two okay sir what is the modified pirani scoring the See, whatever what the 6 point pirani scoring what we are using is modified pirani scoring the original pirani scoring was 10 point right it is very nicely given in our uh, textbooks it is there also in campbell right you can go and read it from there but what is used in clinic is the 6 point pirani score and sir how do you differentiate between flexible flexible and complex club foot any clinical difference flexible and see this is uh, comparing orange to apples right flexible is totally different it is idiopathic right a complex club foot is a derivative of treatment right as we have as uh, dr matthew was just told us that it is it occurs because of uh, it is iatrogenic right so okay. okay and one student wants to know that uh, in exams uh, it is often asked that what is the differential diagnosis of ctv what should we should uh, say well i told you the differential you diagnosis are. of ctv right according to the causes according to the treatment okay. right it was okay. there on the slide okay yeah. and uh, if a if a patient Doctor. presents late then how do you differentiate between congenital and acquired ctv see acquired ctv what do you mean by acquired ctv that means there is a secondary cause to it right there might be a neurological cause or there might be a syndromic cause so i was stressing again and again right from the beginning that don't jump upon the diagnosis as soon as you find a case of idiopathic clot you have to examine the spine you have to take proper history you have to examine the hips and contralateral and axillary lines if there are telltale signs if there is neurological uh, deficit and uh, if the history tells you so it becomes a acquired club if these things are missing and the uh, history tells you that it is present since birth it becomes a idiopathic club now remember that these are you have to present these points objectively right if you present all of these are relative points but if spoken objectively you will save through the exam Dr. Maninder, please continue. Uh, Dr. Manish, 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 one one comment, yeah, yeah, one sure. one comment only. Uh, Dr. Uh, Alok, you have told a very nice uh, treatment about the modified ponsity. One more point we have to add on that one: the flexion at the knee joint has to be more than 100 degree angle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's correct. 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 Okay, that's i'm sure Thanks. you agree with that thanks dr jha want to say yes that. i just wanted to say that there was a question regarding internal rotation of the tibia if i uh, understood it correctly i must make it clear that this is a hyped perception that there is a residual internal rotation deformity there have been studies which have suggested that contrary to this belief there is external rotation deformity of the tibia and in a normal person if it is 20 degree in a club foot it is 12 degree so we should have a relook and reexamine the patient and also look into the literature thank you uh, you are very right sir you are very right it is hype so no, normally we thank do you. not have to do anything for the intorsion thank you sir uh, can i now invite dr matthew wagi uh, for his next talk uh, on post polio deformity and foot drop dr matthew sir please share your screen
Thank you very much. I wonder how many of them would be ready to listen to after such exhaustive and such wonderfully planned and presented lectures. Uh, I'm not sure how, how I can justify my presence here. Because sir, PGs, I used... are, sir, PGs are having exams and I am getting message that please, we want to listen to Dr. Matthews. You will not, not cut him short, but I request you to be up to the time. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how much time I have, but anyway, I'll speak to what you can stop me whenever that's okay. Um, the reason I, I'll have a different type of a lecture because all these lectures were taken many years back when I used to have those hard slides and I don't have them converted into the regular slides. So therefore, I apologize um, for an incomplete set of slides. I'm sorry for that. I just didn't have time to pull out my old slides, convert them into digital slides, and then do them. And I didn't have videos at that time. Um, and I couldn't pull out, I could take patients and do it, but then in this times of Corona times, I couldn't do it. So apologies to all the postgraduates who are eagerly looking forward to this. Uh, but I must uh, say that I'm going to disappoint them on this. Uh, after such wonderful lectures from all uh, the participants, what is it? So fortunately, polio is eradicated. 2011 was the last case. So it's nine years down the line. So if a child who gets paralyzed around 2010, 2009, he would be or she would be at least 10 or 12 at this point of time who will be brought to you. So earlier days, the question was, if you're given a case of polio with a foot deformity, that was the most common short case that you got. Um, so the question the examiner would ask you, why do you think it is polio? So you have to be very clear on why you're saying that particular case is polio. Number one, it is an asymmetric paralysis. Now, what do you mean by asymmetric? Symmetry between the two sides, right and the left side. So right side is more severely paralyzed, left side is left severely paralyzed. A patchy paralysis. What is the difference between patchy and asymmetric? Patchy means within the same leg, some muscles are more severely paralyzed and some are less severely paralyzed. So an asymmetric patchy paralysis, which is lower motor neuron paralysis. So you have to describe the features of a lower motor neuron paralysis. And what are the features of lower motor neuron paralysis? It is characterized by muscle wasting. It is characterized by atrophy and muscle wasting, absence or flexes, and a normal or an absent plantar response. You don't have an upgoing plantar. So therefore, you need to describe that. I'm saying this because I find many of the students are not able to describe this well. The second thing about polio is it is a non-progressive paralysis, non-progressive. So this is very important. In today's time, if it is 10 to 15 year old girl or boy child with a deformity, which looks like polio, a very common differential that we have is charcot marie -Tooth disease. The difference of charcot marie -Tooth disease, it's a progressive condition. Polio is necessary and important. Charcot marie -Tooth disease has sensory loss. It's a subtle sensory loss, but it is there. But in polio, there is no sensory loss. So you boldly tell the examiner, sir, this is an acquired paralysis, an acquired deformity, not from birth, number one. Number two, there is paralysis, which is lower motor neuron. And the lower motor neuron paralysis is asymmetric. It is patchy, clear definition of the paralysis that is there. And on top of that, it is a non progression It's a pure motor paralysis, no sensory deficit. That sums up your polio paralytic condition. The next thing that you look for is, is there any telltale mark of any other neurological deficit? And what are they? The most common one which you miss is a sensory deficit. That's a trophic ulcer. The second thing that the patient may not complain or the parents may not complain relate to bladder and bowel function. Quite often, they may, tell, they may not tell you, 
out of modesty they even the child might be spelling of urine because he is using a diaper or there is dribbling of urine such as clearly a neurological deficit tropic ulcers are always there if there is sensory deficit so if you have intact sensory condition you have callosity if you have poor sensory condition you have tropic ulcers like this child with spina bifida with sensory deficit in the s1 l5 area had a clear tropic ulcer so this is an important differentiating point dr maninder beautifully described all the examinations of the foot that makes my task easier in polio of the lower limb the most commonly paralyzed muscle is quadriceps femoris however the most severely paralyzed muscle which is important for the postgraduate which causes a foot deformity is tibialis anterior so older examiners like me are fond of asking why is tibialis anterior the most common muscle paralyzed so the answer is tibialis anterior muscle has short representation in the spinal cord so if the anterior horn cells in that area is affected by polio virus you have a total paralysis of tibialis anterior and that segment that is be the next question which segment is that that is l4 segment l4 segment in the spinal cord where tibialis anterior is represented it's a very small segment and that causes a severe paralysis of the foot tibialis muscle therefore you need to understand why the patient presents with that particular features of tibialis anterior paralysis the most commonly involved muscle in the upper limb relate to the deltoid in the shoulder and opponents in the hand again don't jump to tell the examiner sir i'm going to operate this patient and give da 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 no are you going to make a difference to the child find out why the child has come to the the hospital many of them have come for a disability certificate they would have come to the clinic for a disability certificate and the examiner who is senior he has seen the patient okay isko examine ke liye bula lo bhaiya call him for the examination and that's a standard thing which happens the child did not need surgery the child has not come for surgery he has come for disability certificate but he is pulled out for an examination and the examiner knows this and he asks what will you do sir i'll do a triple arthrodesis and followed by a tendon transfer and the examiner will ask the candidate yes bachche operation karaoge nahi sahab hum to certificate ke liye aaye the you cut a sorry figure there don't do that talk to the patient find out can you make a difference to that child in your management the type of surgery that you do in polio you have to understand one most common is correction of deformity and that's what you see in foot a correction of deformity a plantigrade foot which equal weight distribution as in a normal foot comparative not equal all over but as in a normal foot that weight distribution should be normalized so that callosities are avoided and that footwear is good wear and tear of the footwear is better so that is why you would want to have a correct weight bearing gait pattern heel to toe that's what your goal is correction of deformities you may do the stabilization procedures because in the foot there are multiple joints multiple joints with multiple muscles are crossing make the foot a bag of bones with instability in between so you reduce the number of joints in the foot to make it a stable platform for weight bearing or load bearing in the normal gait process that's stabilization and the next thing that you do is balance support so if there is a severe varus deformity with a very powerful tibialis posterior or a very powerful inverter or a severe valgus deformity with a very powerful inverter you can balance it with a tendon transfer because merely doing a foot stabilization procedure or a correction of deformity will not stop the deformity from recurring because with the muscle imbalance persisting the deformity will come back and lastly we have limb lengthening as a procedure and this is important why because you will have patients coming to you with foot deformity with the quinus the candidate says sir for correction deformity and i'll do a triple arthrodesis lambrinidae take a wedge and correct the foot into neutral position he may have missed a 4 cm shortening of the leg 
which will cause the equinus to persist. The parents will come back to me, Dr. Sahib, you have to write the ADVB. So you need to understand the nature of the deformity of full examination is important. So then the next question is, why is the deformity there in this patient? The deformity is there because of several reasons. One is muscle imbalance. So mediolateral instability, in, imbalance, dorsoventral imbalance, and a combination of the various things which causes imbalance. But there are some children who come to you with a severe, totally paralyzed foot, and yet they have an equinus. And that may be because the child is sitting all day with the feet hanging down in equinus position, gravity contributing, posture contributing to the deformity. Or is sitting all day and in cross leg position, if you notice, your foot is in equinus and in varus, and you have a deformity which is like that. Then the dynamics of activity. What do you mean by that? And the classical example is the calcaneus foot. I'll come to that when we talk about the calcaneus foot. The next thing is dynamics of growth. So you have paralyzed muscles which do not have the normal sarcomere. The sarcomeres are replaced by atrophic fibrotic muscle which are not elastic like the normal muscles. And when the bone grows normally, the fibrotic muscles being inelastic do not keep pace with the bone growth as the normal muscle. So the dynamics of the normal growth of the skeletal system contributes to your deformity. So when the examiner asks you, why does this patient have this deformity? Sir, he has the deformity. One, the imbalance of muscle. Number two, there is a clear contribution by dynamics of activity and posture and gravity in this also. And if there is a, a limb length discrepancy, you can also say, sir, there is dynamics of growth also contribute. When do you operate? The first section is not relevant here because olden days we used to tell we do not operate immediately after the paralysis is there because the paralysis is initially a severe anterior horn cell paralysis of certain cells. Because of that, there is inflammation in the surrounding area. So the surround edematous from inflammation. So surrounding muscles Surrounding anterior horn cells are paralyzed because of inflammation, which recovers after some time. So a lot of polio children, when you wait and watch them over one and a half, two years, you will have some recovery happening because of the inflammatory sling and those neurons coming back to their normal function. So therefore, we need to understand this was the old region. Now you won't see any fresh polio unless you're going for a camp in Tajikistan or Sudan or somewhere. There you will see fresh polio. Tendon transfers are what you do and recommend in skeletally mature patients. Extra articular fusions are what you recommend in three to eight years children. You don't do extra articular procedures in less than three. You don't do, do extra articular procedures in more than eight. You do recommend triple arthrodesis. In girls particularly, they achieve maturity around menarche. So if it is a girl child, 12 year old, you have to ask for menarche as part of your history taking. In boys, it's usually about 12 to 14, somewhere down the line. You do not include the ankle infusion because an infusion of the ankle, the lower tibial physis may be affected and you'll contribute to the So ankle arthrodesis is only after the lower tibial physis has fused. Again, you need to understand the anatomy of the foot. And we had such beautiful lectures on clinical examination and uh, Kamal Dureja's lecture talking about the sinus star side. So you need to understand the different positions of various bones and the relationships that are there. Uh, is my cursor visible? An important thing that is not understood by many is that many think that the calcaneus cuboid joint is either in front or behind the telonavicular. But look at it anatomically. It's exactly at the same level. It's exactly at the same level. A lot of students do not understand this, except when you have whereas this portion goes medially, and when you are having valgus, this comes more posteriorly. So you have to understand the dynamics of the foot anatomy before you talk about the positions that you do. Then again, the medial side. A uh, most common thing that they don't understand is the mid-tarsal joint here, 
that sustentaculum telli is the mid tarsal joint here, the, 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 the middle middle subtalar joint not mid tarsal the middle subtalar joint that's a sustentaculum telli here which is articulating here the sustentaculum telli is a very important shelf sustentacular means the shelf it's an important shelf for anatomical landmarks to be recognized by the postgraduate both in club foot treatment and in polio management for tendon transfers and fusions of joints the the superficial deltoid ligament is attached here so when you doing a medial release you do release of the superficial deltoid ligament the deep part of the deltoid is attached to the talus you never cut that you only cut the superficial deltoid the flexor hallucis is longest tendon passes behind this that's an important part of a maintenance of the arch of the foot so you need to understand there are longitudinal arches and there are transverse arches of the foot in polio deformity because of muscle paralysis and the imbalance the arch either becomes exaggerated or it collapses but to understand when what is happening you need to understand the different arches of you have a medial longitudinal arch which is deep you have a lateral longitudinal arch which is shallow you have that's the lateral longitudinal arch which is shallow this was arch in front which is again shallow middle which is deep so you need to understand the arches are important but the most important thing in polio is to understand what is it which muscle is maintaining what arch and therefore you should know how to test each muscle in the foot individually and to learn that you have to practice individually so on the lateral side a very important muscle is the peroneus longus to maintain the arch why though it is a muscle on the lateral side it cuts across this tunnel here under the cuboid cuts across the sole of the foot to go and get inserted onto the medial side of the foot so it is an important support of the arch the transverse and the longitudinal of the foot it's an important supporter so peroneus longus if it is overacting the arch gets exaggerated if the peroneus longus is underacting it is collapsed so you need to understand the principle which this is happening then it is working like a suspension bridge you have the suspension bridge concept which holds up the arches in a suspension bridge again you have the flexor hallucis longus remember i told you the sustentaculum telli the sustentaculum telli here under this is the flexor hallucis longus passing it is holding up the medial arch by holding up an intact flexor hallucis longus tendon right across in addition to holding up the arch it is holding up like a tie beam across which is also contributed by the plantar aponeurosis plantar aponeurosis is also a tie beam up which is up the arch of the foot so you need to understand the basic patho mechanics of the whole arches of the foot and the dynamics of how they are maintained in addition there are the ligaments that are contributing the ligaments in polio fail secondary to failure of the tendons and secondary to muscle paralysis so if tendon has been paralyzed because of muscle paralysis over a period of time these ligaments initially they hold up and then they pack up so these ligaments which work as pulls in an arch of a bridge which pack up and they collapse the arch so this is an important understanding for the biomechanics and the key stone here is this talus which is resting on the dome and if the key stone collapses the arch collapses so you have no choice but to understand this mechanics of the foot to understand the foot so let's look at the anatomy here we have the tibialis anterior which is an important muscle which comes anteriorly goes to get inserted on the base of the first metatarsal and part of the medial cuneiform there so this is a very important inverter muscle another inverter muscle which is the tibialis posterior which is inserted to the tuberosity of the navicular and if you remember the flexor hallucis longus cuts across beneath the tuberosity beneath the sustentaculum telli and going here like that so these are key muscles on the medial side which contribute to integrity of the arch of the foot 
I've spent a little extra time on this because in understanding foot deformities in polio, you need to understand this. So let's look at the deformities. The deformity that you have is equinus. The word equinus comes from ictus. The word ictus comes from the family of horses and asses. Not just horses, but asses also. The equine group of animals which walk on their toes. So the equinus comes from vertically aligned metatarsals. In the animal kingdom, horses and asses have vertically aligned metatarsals. So you have an equinus combined with valgus or varus, both are possible. The primary is vertically aligned metatarsals. The second thing is the calcaneus, where the triceps ray is the most important muscle which is giving you the powerhouse for walking. The powerhouse for walking is triceps uri. When that is paralyzed, the calcaneus goes into dorsiflexion. And when the ankle and the foot goes into dorsiflexion, and it's in that position, it's a calcaneus foot. Now, calcaneus is a very important thing to recognize. The next deformity we have is the clawing of the toes. Clawing, by definition, again, drawing parallels from the animal kingdom, hyperextension of the metatarsophalangeal joint with flexion of the interphalangeal joint, which means the extensors of the MP joint have to be intact, the flexors of the IP joint have to be intact. So that's an important part of clawing of the toes. And the next component is the cavus of the foot, cavo varus or cavo valgus, when the arch is exaggerated. Now there is a gray area when do you call the arch really exaggerated? You first compare with the opposite side and see, is it comparable to the opposite side? When both sides have a very mild arch, it becomes difficult for you to say, but it's a visual perception that you can say. Uh, my foot surgeon colleagues can give better definitions on that. I'm not going to depths of that. Then you have a rare deformity, which is a dorsal bunion. I'll explain that a little. Now, Peabody's classification to understand polio paralysis is the best and there is no better explanation to understand, better taxonomy to understand the deformities caused by paralytic poliomyelitis. So he described the paralysis based on groups or individual muscles that are paralyzed. Four categories, Peabody's classification. First, a limited extensor inverter insufficiency. Number two, a gross extensor inverter insufficiency. And number three, everter insufficiency. And number four, triceps sura insufficiency. We'll take them one by one. Let's look at it. What do you mean by a limited extensor inverter insufficiency? So if you look at tibialis anterior, what does it do? It's an inverter of the foot. Is it only an inverter? No, it's also a dorsiflexor of the foot. It's an extensor of the ankle. So it's a dorsiflexor of the ankle. So when you have tibialis anterior only paralyzed, you have a foot that goes into a deformity which is peculiar. And what is the deformity? Tibialis anterior is paralyzed, so a compensatory mechanism happens. Dorsiflexor is weak, the foot goes into equinus. The foot also goes into cavus. Why does it go into cavus? I'll explain shortly. It may at times go into a plano valgus because of a relative weakness also of the peroneus longus muscle. Let's understand this. Now this patient, he's got a tibialis anterior weakness, a mild weakness that is there, grade three power. Tibialis posterior is grade five. Everters are very good, grade four to five. Triceps array is good. What do you see in him? He's got an exaggerated cavus. How has he developed an exaggerated cavus? Remember, the tibialis anterior muscle on the medial side is balanced by one muscle on the lateral side. And what is that muscle? An important muscle, which is peroneus longus. What does the peroneus longus do? Tibialis anterior was supposed to elevate the first ray base. Peroneus longus takes the foot into pronation and eversion. When it does that in the eversion, exactly as happens in club foot, when you pronate the foot, the arch goes up. So there is cavus of the foot. Now the dorsiflexor is weak. There is an imbalance between dorsiflexors and triceps surae. 
Now look at the design of the foot. It's brilliantly done. A very powerful calf muscle at the back of the calf is balanced by measly strap muscles in the front of the leg. Solid calf muscle you have, balanced by measly strap muscles, thin muscles on the anterior portion of the leg. How has that happened? Nature has brilliantly designed it because the axis of the ankle joint is the tip of the middle malleolus. Tip of the middle malleolus. There, if you see the act. The liver arm for the triceps today is a short liver arm. Look at the liver arm for the tibialis anterior; it's long. Look at the liver arm for the EHL; it's really long. So a weak muscle has been compensated with a long liver arm. A strong muscle has been compensated with a short. So between the two, they balance each other. But when tibialis anterior is paralyzed, a muscle comes to its aid, help by अपने भाई जो डॉ उसको हेल्प करना है कैसे हेल्प करना है बाय ओवर एक्टिंग द एक्सटेंस हेलोसिस सो व्हाट डज इट डू द पेरोनियस लॉन्गस इज प्रोनेटिंग द फर्स्ट रे द ईएचएल नाउ इज हाइपर एक्सटेंडिंग द एमपी जॉइंट एंड टेकिंग द द डिस्टल फैलेंक्स इनटू डॉसिफ्लेक्शन सो दिस इज फर्दर कंट्रीब्यूटिंग टू एक्सजरेशन ऑफ द केवस इन एडिशन एन इंट्रैक्ट फ्लेक्सर हेलोसिस लॉन्गस कीप्स इट इन फ्लेक्शन सो यू हैव अ क्लियर recommendation for a tibialis anterior limited extensor inverted paralysis causes classically exaggerated cavus pronated foot a clawing of the foot which because it is a dorsiflexor paralysis and when does the dorsiflexor muscle work it works in your swing phase so you have a swing phase clawing that's the classical of tibialis anterior paralysis look at the gait of the patient and you will have a swing phase clawing the tibialis anterior paralysis i hope that's clear the next is a gross extensor inverter insufficiency and what is that analysis of the extensor as well as both are gone okay so the extensor analysis is not that to compensate for a weak tibialis anterior so that hyper extension of the great toe that happens in the the type 1 p body classification doesn't happen here so you have a paralytic equinus you may have a equino valgus depending on the degree of power of the peroneae and that's all in type b if both the inverters are gone tibialis anterior and tibialis posterior are gone you have a valgus component all inverters are gone you have a valgus component of the deformity so that's what you have in the type b the gross inverter everter insufficiency the third category is the everter insufficiency if you have everter insufficiency you have varus of the foot and the last is triceps surae insufficiency which i mentioned is the power house for your walking if it is paralyzed you have a calcaneus or a calcaneo cavus foot let's look at each of these now let's look at this foot this foot has got a severe varus a severe cavus okay which means the peronea are reasonably powerful you have probably the tibialis anterior and posterior both paralyzed and you have the foot in cavus presenting like that equino there is tendoaculus is intact that's working so you have a in this position look at that lateral outer border weight bearing is there dr maninder showed how must you examine front side back i always like to tell patients and uh, the, the the resident doctors always put the patient prone and examine the sole of the foot from front side and the top of the foot that's the best position prone position flex the knee and look at the foot from the top and from front side and 360 degree you must examine that gives you a classical picture of the deformity in the foot that's it that's a severe varus that is there you have the varus that is there the the cavus that is there tibialis anterior is paralyzed here the tibialis posterior has to be intact if the tibialis posterior were not intact the foot would won't go into a, a varus position here if you see here the great toe has not gone into extension the great toe has not gone into extension here the tibialis anterior is weak there is cavus there is equinus there is varus so if you have equinus which means imbalance between plantar flexors and dorsiflexors Dorsiflexors are weak. If you have cavus, which means peroneus longus is working, 
the bellus anterior is not working if there is no clawing here which means extensor hallux longus is also paralyzed so this is a type a a gross extensor everter insufficiency first we saw a type 1 limited extensor everter this is a type 2 uh, type 2 uh, a uh, gross extensor everter insufficiency so if you see this that's a very severe equinus that you have as the heel becomes small if you see this heel this is a broad heel in calcaneus the heel becomes broad remember a very simple way to check sometimes it becomes difficult as dr maninder mentioned when you hold the foot when it is a valgus deformity coming up it looks as if there is a calcaneus also but if you have to heel has to be held in neutral position to check for dorsiflexion plantar flexion dorsiflexion plantar flexion has to be checked with heel in neutral position when you do that and do dorsiflexion you will find heel going into severe calcaneus position why does the heel broaden the heel broadens because excessive weight is coming only on the heel why is the heel small here because no weight bearing happened here so no weight bearing means calcaneum did not develop properly excessive weight bearing means calcaneum is broader and it's wider so that's your picture from the back let's look the picture from here now why do you have cavus in a calcaneus foot now again remember i said the power house for walking is triceps sura when the power house of walking is paralyzed as in this patient wasted calf the calcaneus foot happens but remember to propel the patient forward the patient wants to walk and push off how do you use push off so the body then tries to substitute muscles and what are the substitute muscles that are available the long toe flexors are available okay the long toe flexors go from here and that's it they don't do anything to the calcaneus they do contribute to a little exaggeration of cavus but not as much there is something else the short toe flexors are indubitably not paralyzed they span the foot arch that when the short toe flexors are working they tend to pull the foot calcaneus front of the foot goes up remember the origin of the short toe flexors are from the calcaneal tuberosity calcaneal tuberosity is behind so when the short toe flexors contract the calcaneal tuberosity comes in front and the heel comes forward the front of the calcaneum goes upward so the reduction of cavus so if the patient continues to walk this is a dynamic deformity this dynamic deformity initially the patient will walk with a mild cavus as he continues to walk over the years he will have a severe cavus deformity which will come up so you need to understand the pathomechanics of calcaneus foot and calcaneus and paralysis here goes with dorsiflexion and dorsiflexion goes with valgus also so the typical deformity that you have in poliomyelitis is equino cavo varus or calcaneo cavo valgus so that a lot of postgraduates are not able to understand the pathology of the cavus that happens i hope it's clear now cavus in calcaneus is from overactive short toe flexors and overactive long toe flexors so what happens so when the patient is trying to push off he overacts his short toe and long toe flexors what does that do it causes clawing of the toes in stance phase so in a calcaneus foot gait cycle you have stance phase clawing in a tibialis anterior paralysis you have swing phase clawing both condition there is clawing one there is swing phase clawing in the other there is stance phase clawing i hope that's clear this is what it is swing phase clawing and stance phase clawing that's a clawing that you see here the bellus anterior is weak and that is what you have so the usual procedure that was done for this was to recommend a jones procedure what is the jones procedure jones procedure was taking the extensor hallucis from here and transferring to the first metatarsal here so that you reduce the number of joints and contribute to elevation of the first tray to reduce the cavus and raise the medial border and efficiency of this in dorsiflexing the foot is improved from 
hyperextending these joints that normally would have happened so therefore all the power is there in dorsiflexing the foot so it works that is the jones transfer but what we do in in uh, in uh, jones transfer there is a little difference between modified jones and jones i'll come to it a little later there's one deformity which we have which is called a dorsal bunion now dorsal bunion can happen from two conditions one is if you have weak peroneus longus the first ray goes down in presence of a tibialis anterior uh, strength the base goes up the weak peroneus longus cannot take the foot into inversion into eversion and because of that the normal compensation of the cavus doesn't happen first ray is down along with the ehl being paralyzed the causes plantar flexors are working ehl is paralyzed the mp joint goes into plantar flexion causing a dorsal bunion so a plantar flexed mp joint like this is known as a dorsal bunion so the pattern mechanics is when the tibialis anterior and the ehl both are paralyzed this can happen with a functioning this with a weak peroneus longus also so the combination prevents a pronation of the foot and a combination causes a dorsal bunion to happen there the modified jones is sometimes the examiner ask you what is the original jones original jones was done with a single incision modified jones is done with the two incisions original jones had a tino disses of the the ip joint of the first uh, hallux in the modified one you do arthrodisses of the ip joint because the tino disses invariably failed in modified jones excision of the tendon excess hallux longus is done uh, in the original one it was not done why is it done because the ehl tendon tends to regenerate over a period of time and your tendon transfer fails over a period of time so do the details in this particular case that i was trying to tell you in patients who have a valgus deformity foot is tending to valgus and the patient is between 3 to 8 years you do an extra articular procedure the difference between grise green and bachelors is only the nature of the graft that is used grise green used a tibial metaphyseal graft bachelors used a fibular graft when i was a postgraduate grise green was a gold standard today bachelors is a growth standard or also you do an arthrorhesis by putting a screw across you don't even put any graft there you just put a screw across because you're buying time till you do a definitive procedure for the joint or a tendon transfer that is done so you need to understand the procedures that are done for cavus foot if you have a cavus foot you need to reduce as dr uh, alok mentioned if the cavus is severe not corrected by your procedures you do a Steinler's operation. In Steinler's operation, there are two things that are important. Commonly, we do a closed pino, uh, plantar aponeurosis cutting. That's what is commonly done. But the classical Steinler's operation had this in addition to the first layer of muscles. So, if the exam examiner asks you what are the first layer of muscles, the candidate starts fumbling. You need to know the first layer of muscles. What are the first layer of muscles? The abductor hallucis, the flex base. and the abductor of the digiti minime of the fifth toe so the candidate should be able to answer what is the stainless operation done for a mild to a moderate cavus stainless operation cutting in the plantar aponeurosis and the first layer of muscles to reduce the degree of cavus so that tell you this is why i said this is the history of the calcaneum from where the short toe muscles are spanning across and that is what contributes to the cavus exaggerated if these are overactive in presence of a paralyzed triceps a lot of students are in fold of a japa's operation for a severe cavus remember japa's operation was a very modified operation which was done for a moderate cavus never a mild cavus never a severe cavus because if you did a japa's operation i'm not going to details of it you don't do it in a severe case why because we did a severe case the weak osteotomy that you do with the medial limb in the cuneiform the lateral limb in the cuboid and the apex in the navicular if you do in a severe case the bone contact will be lost and you have a non union 
with the midfoot happening we do not recommend that so japa's operation is never done for a severe cavus it is always done for a moderate cavus never done for a mild cavus never done for a severe cavus and then a foot stabilization procedure that is commonly done is triple arthrodis so triple arthrodis is it's different procedures so a lot of students are fond of asking lambrinides procedures without understanding what is the lambrinides procedure lambrinides procedure is classically done is for the most common deformity that you see in polio polio foot that is equino cavo verus so when you have a fixed equinus you take out appropriate wedges and do a triple arthrodesis to correct the equinus and you correct the verus and that's the classical lambrinudi the modifications are all done when you have a calcaneous deformity La reverse lambrinudi or uh, excision of the navicular to liver arm lengthening of the posterior shortening of the anterior liver arm excision of the navicular is done or you create a beak into the navicular that is a hoax procedure so the different procedures that are done but the key that is done in an equino cavo verus deformity is a foot stabilization procedure where you do a lambrinudi done in an equino cavo verus deformity so three joints calcaneo cuboid talo navicular and the subtalar posterior subtalar middle subtalar right here and the anterior subtalar all are fused in a classical paralyzed foot to provide a stable platform stable ankle for walking and you combine this with a triple arthrodesis this is a patient okay well okay, whereas triple arthrodesis is done balanced plantigrade foot and then you get the patient but never never recommend a lambrinudi without a lateral view of the x-ray so first you have double checked is come for surgery not come for disability certificate then you have examined fully the equinus is not contributed by limb length discrepancy equinus is there mild limb length discrepancy is there and you're going to benefit him with a lambrinudi procedure but never recommend a lambrinudi without a lateral view x-ray make out lambrinudi will have a wedge cutting from here to here if it is a severe one you will knock off the head and neck of the talus what will happen when you knock off the neck of the talus blood supply to the body of the talus is gone when blood flow to the body of the talus is gone you have avascular necrosis of the talus so you check out draw wedges and see if the deformity can be corrected with the wedge that you are planning if it is not corrected you do a staged lambrinudi reduce the degree of equinus by whatever procedure you have in your control soft tissue procedure lilizura whatever you want to do and get the lambrinudi otherwise you will be in a disaster so in severe equinus procedure do not recommend a straight away lambrinudi reduce the equinus otherwise you end up with decapitating talus you don't want that reverse lambrinudi is done in a calcaneous foot again what is the difference difference is you take out wedge not from the head and neck but from the back of the calcaneum and the talus and that's the reverse lambrinudi you reduce the degree of calcaneus the anterior border of the calcaneum is see there is cavus the anterior border process of the calcaneum is more vertically aligned it's raised up it's elevated so you have to bring it down to a more normal relationship and that's what you have done you have brought it down by doing a reverse lambrinudi procedure and you've corrected the foot deformity and it's a more plantigrade foot so that's what you have a reverse lambrinudi in this calcaneus foot coming to some uh, quite unlike a uh, lambrinudi procedure but doesn't need any stabilization with any cavars or screws in this because it's an unstable foot you need to stabilize it with the sword uh, cavar then the would you do the tendon transfer first or would you do the arthrodesis first sir i would do the tendon transfer first why because when you do a triple arthrodesis or any foot stabilization procedure you take wedges of bone out if it doesn't tend and transfer and then then the wedges your muscle length will be lax when that happens your muscle power goes remember starling's law greater the length of the muscle lesser the power that is generated so you have to understand this so you never do a tendon transfer first and that wedge resection to correct deformity and arthrodesis you always do an arthrodesis and only then can have a proper tension of the tendon to do a good muscle balancing procedure
fan teller operation i mentioned only a skeletal maturity single stage or two stage can always be i have done both and it works well but make sure so this is a two stage this is a calcaneus deformity so it's a flail ankle flail ankle with just short toe muscles of the foot working with severe kvs i did a two stage fan teller in this and the foot was corrected two stage fan teller was done why if you see here you do a foot stabilization procedure when there is medial lateral stability look at this so you have to do stress access to check for medial lateral stability there was no medial lateral stability here so i had no choice but to see this lateral side is open middle side is closed i have to do an ankle fusion here otherwise it will soon become arthritic and it will soon become painful and the patient will beg for an arthrodesis in this situation so therefore i had to do an arthrodesis in this particular position dr always the finishing we, always uh, look for i'm just finishing always maninder mentioned examine the footwear especially if it is an old footwear look for the footwear wear patterns will give you to the sole of the footwear gives you the heart of the in the foot so summarize careful clinical examination front sides and back always examine in prone position also accurate muscle charting learn muscle charting properly never comment on equinus without checking for quadriceps power without checking for limb length discrepancy and always examine the foot footwear thank you so much thank you dr matthews uh, dr maninder yes sir we will take questions at the end i think we finish uh, two lectures and then we take yes. questions okay sorry Can i uh, no problem yeah. I I just wanted to see this. This was a wonderful insight, a dynamic insight into the various uh, deformities that do take place. I only want to make a point. Thank you, sir. Do not proceed for making a triple arthrodesis. Try to think in terms of uh, joint sparing procedures, which already have been discussed in so detail. because yes. triple arthrodesis produces osteoarthritis of the neighboring joints and many a times the talonavicular joint they do not uh, unite so there is a persistent non union and as you have rightly said for a calcaneus deformity you turn an l shaped foot into a t shaped foot very good presentation thank you thank you sir excellent thank talk you, sir. dr bagish it was an excellent talk thank you uh, can i now invite dr rajesh simon uh, to give his talk on short case on acquired acquired adult flat foot i know you've been waiting uh, dr rajesh and you cancel one of your appointments later on so thank you so much please share your screen thank you uh uh Manindar and thank you, Delhi Orthotic Association. It's a privilege to talk, uh, and a very big, uh, uh, difficult thing to talk after a beautiful talk of Dr. Matthew Vargas and a, such an eminent teacher. Thank you, sir. And such a lucid presentation. So it is uh, a privilege, sir, to talk after you, and uh, I would also appreciate the author TV how much. Word, Uh, the work they are doing for the education of the, of the India. So uh, my talk on today is of the examination of a posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. Now this is a completely an adult problem. We are talking about an adult foot. We're not talking about a child foot because the dysfunction happens usually in adults. So we know uh, we've already seen the tibialis posterior, the uh, posterior tibial tendon. It is comes from behind of the calf and uh, bones around the uh, the back of the posterior mal uh, the medial malleolus, posterior aspect of the medial malleolus, and gets attached to the navicle and to the cuboid. Yeah, you know I mean into 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 cuneiform area. And this is like Dr. Matthew Vargas was saying about the sling, uh, about the support. It supports the the the, the um, medial aspects as a dynamic supporter. And 
uh, when you have tears around this particular area or when you have some uh, vascularity problems, then your arch starts collapsing slowly. And that is what we see in a posterior tibial dysfunction, a normal looking foot becoming flat and this is what we normally see. So the, the, the posterior tibial tendon, as we saw dynamically is uh, in the video, uh, is a dynamic uh, um, uh, structure, and it helps in the inversion of the subtalar joint, adduction of the forefoot, and the supination of the forefoot. So it's a very important muscle and it is the one muscle that initiates the heel rise. That is something which you should remember. The heel rise which we do is initiated by the, the, the posterior tibial tendon. So if the tendon dysfunctions, that is first thing which we see is the failure of the heel rise. And because of that failure of the muscles, we see the the arches collapses. The other things which collapse, uh, which supports the arch is the static stabilizer, which we call as a spring ligament or the, the, cali uh, the calcaneo navicular ligament. And that is one of another static structure which really stabilizes the medial column or the medial arch of the foot. So along with the dynamic stabilizer of tibial, uh, the posterior tibial tendon, the FHL, to some extent FDL and the static stabilizer, the arch is maintained. And when the, the posterior tibial tendon dysfunction starts, because of various reasons, the, the, the medial part is stretched out and the arch starts collapsing. So here is the scenario, clinical scenario. And this particular problem is usually seen in a middle-aged lady little mildly obese, which we normally see in a lot of Indian population, overweight to obesity, and they come with a pain and swelling around the ankle. Now it is up to us as a clinician to examine and to find out where exactly is the problem. They will come with their complaints of pain around the ankle, pain around them and in the foot, and uh, Many a times in India, we find this is, this is diagnosed as the uric acid problems and all. So you got to examine here. So in a dictum, like we have been seeing uh, what Manindar had shown and what Professor Jas said, it is like inspection palpation. The dictum in the foot and ankle is look, feel, and move. So you got to look, that is the inspection you got to feel that is a palpation and you got to move the joint to find them to see whether it is a supple or it is a rigid deformity. And then you got to investigate as per the necessity. So you got to diagnose, you got to understand that this is a diagnosis of clinical examination. You cannot diagnose a posterior tibial with an MRI because that is not an investigation of choice. A simple x-ray, a standing x-ray is good enough, but the most important part is the diagnosis with a clinical examination, and that is very important here. So how do we look at the foot? The, just the first part is not helpful. So you have a foot, a lady presenting here with a sari or a pant or whatever, the trousers, and you see, okay, that's not bad. It's not very bad foot, but when you examine in totality, you will find here. So when you lift up the, uh, the, the dress and see now you're looking at something, something is wrong here. In this particular area, the midfoot area, the, uh, the hind foot looks to be slightly in valgus. The midfoot seems to be, you know, slight problem. The there is some kind of collapse there in the arch. Then the most important part, look from behind. So in an adult flat foot or in a patient complaining of pain in, in, in the high ankle area, always, always make it a dictum to look the patient from behind, ask them to stand there, and then you will realize the amount of hind foot valgus. It can be mild to severe, and then you can also see normally 
you see only one, I mean, little toe or maximum of one and a half toes in a, in a slightly valcoid part. But more than that is too many toe signs. And that is what we see here. The more the valgus, the planar valgus deformity, the more the dysfunction of the, the posterior tibial uh, tendon, the, the, uh, the middle structure failing and the valgus increasing. And that is what is called as a too many toe signs. So that is what uh, from behind. Now, when you go back and now you examine the patient from the front or the, from the side, then you look at the swelling. And that typically the swelling would be around the medial malleolus, behind and around the medial malleolus. And if you palpate further, I mean, when we look further here, there will be swelling here. That is the zone of vascularity of the posterior tibia, uh, the, the, the tibialis posterior tendon. And that is where the patient would actually point out pain when you look at the swelling and you ask the swelling, does it pain? They will come and point out that particular area and say, yes, that is a area of swelling. When you make them stand, yes, you will see the arches collapsed. It could be in early stages, it could be just the swelling. As the stage progresses, the arch collapses and that is what you got to see. As the stages progresses and the arch collapses and it becomes a planar valgus area and that is when you start having the pain around the lateral aspect. So early stages, you will not have the problem in lateral aspect. As the stage progresses, the, the, the lateral aspect pain happens and that is because of the subfibular impingement. None of the examination of the foot, as Dr. Maninder said, uh, and, and uh, Professor Vergis has also said, you always have to examine the foot in the, in, the, in the plantar aspect. You've got to look at the plantar aspect. And here, immediately you can realize the amount of weight-bearing area is much more broadened compared to the normal-looking foot. So it is important as a, uh, when, you, when you are examining or when you're telling your examiner uh, uh, start from the hind foot, talk about the midfoot, and look at the plantar aspect. So you look, the inspection is complete with the plantar aspect, and that is where you have to say. And then you go and feel, feel for the hind foot, whether the hind foot varus or valgus is, um, here it is always valgus and it is supple or rigid, the tenderness, which I showed you the picture of where the me median malleolus to navicular, that is the most tender area. And then look at the lateral side, whether there is a subfibular impingement causing a subfibular impingement and leading to peroneal impingement. And then look at the subtalar or the navicular area, whether they have become arthritic as we normally see in a late stage. So look and feel. And by this time, you have come to a clinical diagnosis, which is important when it comes to a adult flat foot because of the posterior tibial tendon. Move the joints. Dr. Maninder has completely showed you exactly how to move the joint, the ankle joint, the subtalar joint movements, the talar navicular, the calcaneocubit. Uh, you've got to assess the movements of all the areas and then you got to ask the patient. As I said initially, the tibial is posterior. The posterior the tibial tendon is the one ten muscle which us, uh, which starts the heel raise. So you got to look for the the heel raise. If you have a normal look, you have functioning tibial is uh, the posterior tibial tendon. Then you can see here it uh, the heel will go into varus. And that is how the normal one would be. But here, when it is not functioning, the, 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 the heel will not go into varus. It remains in valgus. And when you ask the patient to have a single leg heel raise, he might be able to do it the first time or the second time. But after repeated movement, uh, asking to do a repeated single heel raise, it cannot, he can, he or she cannot do because the tibial is posterior, the, the posterior tibial is not functioning well. So the double heel uh, test, heel raise test is important to see whether it is 
uh, functioning, whether the hind foot is supple or rigid, and the single heel raise test is to see whether it is functioning at all or not. So this is very important to, uh, to, to assess. And the one point which you ask in a clinically is, when you, many patients might lean onto the wall and help themselves to heel raise. So you should ask them not to lean too much. You can take a support, but not to lean too much. So then uh, Dr. Kamal Doreja already talked about the x-rays. I'll just go about it. We have the talonavicular coverage. So after the clinical examination, you already have made a clinical diagnosis. Now what, when the examiner asks, we'll say a weight-bearing x-ray. So x-rays in the AP uh, and, uh, and the lateral. So these two are important here. And this X-ray is the, what are the things which you will look at the X-ray. The, in the NAP view, you look at the talonavicular coverage. So you got to understand when the posterior tibial is not functioning well, the opposite muscle is the peroneus brevis. And the peroneus brevis will take the forefoot into abduction. So as the severity progresses, the forefoot abduction increases, and that is why it leads to the talonavicular uncoverage. So that is where you got to look at it. The talonavicular coverage, uncoverage happens over the period of time as the disease progresses. So you got to see the talonavicular uncoverage. The kite angle is more of a theory, but more important in, in the lateral weight bearing is one of the most commonly done is the Meares angle. So the Meares angle is the angle long axis between the talus and the long axis of the first metatarsal. So normal Meares angle is zero to four degree, maximum four degree. But as the, the failure of the posterior tibial progresses, you'll find the talus dipping down and that is why the Meary angle starts increasing, and that is one, uh, uh, one, one of the important criteria on deciding how the treatment to progress. So, we, and the, in, in the AP view, the important part is to look at the talonavicular uncoverage, uh, and in the lateral view, the calcaneal pitch and the, the, the Meary's angle. So, this is the calcaneal pitch which I was talking about, the ankle. Uh, down bit, uh, in front, uh, the, the line between the, the, the tip of the, uh, I mean, from the plantar aspect and to the, the slant of the calcaneum. So in the calcaneal pitch, you can compare that with the, the normal side and you can find out exactly how much of calcaneal pitch has reduced. So that also helps out. So these are the two or three angles or which are three measurements which you should remember the Meares angle, the calcaneal pitch, and the talonavicular uncoverage. And that is all you mostly need. You don't need any fancy investigations further to diagnose this most of the time. And ultrasound is good enough to understand the tibialis posterior becoming synovial. MRI, of course, now when you think about the present day, MRI, of course, is helpful, but it does not helpful in diagnosis whether it is functioning or not. It is synovial thickening, it is hyperemic, yes or no. But how much of function, MRI is useless. So MRI is more of an additive to see what the cartilage and all that, but not to make the diagnosis. So it is a clinical diagnosis added on with the x-rays. How do you proceed? So this was a classification that came out and still in, uh, helpful um, in most of the uh, planning of, uh, of the treatment. The Johnson and Storm classification that came out in 1989, stage one, two, three, the simple classification, mild, moderate, and severe, depending upon the swelling, the heel raise test, too many toe signs, deformity, you uh, make it at stage one, two, and three, and then, in, in, in one, one more thing, when you talk about foot and ankle, most of the classifications, you'll have a, 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 a um, modification, which is usually you can blindly say as Myerson's mod modification most of the time. So Myerson came out with a modification uh, of the stage one, two, three, and he added on with four 
because the ankle joint involvement was also important. So here you can see the Taylor uncoverage. So you that was the X-ray diagnosis, less than 30 percentage, more than 30 percentage. That explains the forefoot abduction. So the severity of the forefoot abduction leads to uncoverage. And that is where you diagnose as 2A and 2B. And when it when you see an arthritic changes, then it is become rigid and it is stage three. And when the ankle joint is started involving the tilt of the lateral Taylor tilt is seen, and that is stage four. So Johnson and Storm classification is still the uh, used uh, as the primary classification with myosin modification, and that is what we use for all the or the treatment plan. So when you have, a, so how do you, uh, once you have diagnosed it, once you've staged it, how do you manage? Always, always talk about conservative management. Don't jump into surgical management initially. Even in practice, we as foot and ankle surgeons, we don't jump into surgery. We always try to give conservative management and the conservative management, which we all do practically, as well as your, for your theoretical knowledge, don't use this word medial arch support. Flat foot is not about just about the arch collapsing. It is about the hind foot going into valgus. It is about the forefoot going into abduction. It is about the arch collapse. So just the medial arch support is not the treatment. You got to have the heel wedges. You got to have a corrective um, insoles, accommodative shoes, and that is how, so it's a simple diagrammatic explanation here. You can see how the heel valgus is corrected with the, 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 uh, the wedge. So the moment you correct the heel valgus, a little amount of arch recreates itself. So you don't just push it with the medial arch. So that is the first conservative treatment. You, most of the time, many, uh, the mild to moderate, you can get away with, with, with conservative management. So now when you have proceeded here and your examiner thinks, okay, then what else if the patient is still not having, then you think, talk about the surgical management. And so, um, this is more for the foot and ankle surgery. So surgical management is initially, you, you still try the brace and then, in the early stage 2A, when there is tenosynovitis, if you are if you are having good arthroscope, then you can do something called a tendoscopy. Here, this is how a tendoscope would look like. Look at that. You are looking at the tibialis posterior. You are, this is the inside the sheet, and then when you uh, this is the where the synovial thickening you can find, and that's my shaver coming in. Sorry, that was my shaver coming in. That was the shaver. So this is the team tendoscopy you can talk about. And when the, 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 the valgus deformity or the forefoot abduction is increasing and stage 2B, then you talk about the rest of the surgeries. Now the stage 2B has got lots and lots of procedures here. So as a PG student, you should know few of these topics. Uh, one is the medial calcaneal displacement osteotomy. So, the medial calcaneal, the start, uh, osteotomy, you osteotomize the calcaneum in the body and medially shift it. And so that is what is done. You shift the uh, medial, uh, the calcaneal body immediately and you change the mechanical axis of the achilles and that helps in, in recreating the, the, the arch by, and, uh, by decreasing the valgus deformity. And then you fix this with a screw and that is what is called as the medial calcaneal displacement osteotomy. One of the workhorse procedures when you do a surgical intervention in the stage two here. Here the deformity is supple or the joints are not involved and that is where you do the osteotomy. And this is how, um, I'll just run through it. This is how you clinically do it. Open up there, make a saw here uh, and open up the, bone and then you shift, you open up the lamina spread and then you shift the bone and then fix it with the screws. And that is uh, how you do about it. After the, uh, the, the shift, the, you, you still have your pain generated as the posterior tibial tendon. And if it is non-functioning, you got to resect it and then transfer it with the flexor digital longus. Now, if you 
uh, saw the, pro, the, the Professor Cheria and the Valgis uh, would talk. You saw how the FDL is. So FDL is just at that sustainable talai area. And you, you open up that area, you find the FDL. And that's how the FDL is in the medial side. Uh, go in the midfoot area, find the, uh, the FDL, and then um, resect, uh, T-node is the distal end to the FHL and resect the it. And then you can loop it into the navicle from the plantar aspect. So you're recreating that tibialis posterior function with a smaller, uh, but more effect, uh, a kind of effective FDL tendon. So why FDL tendon? If you examine us, it is because the, it is more easier to approach. It is in the same area, just behind the posterior tibial tendon, you can get this FDL. So you got to reset it from the master knot of Henry and separate it out from the FHL and then attach this to the, the, the tibialis, uh, to the navicular area, kind of recreating the posterior tibial insertion. So this you can do in uh, uh, stages and uh, you can use a tenodis screw. So, and this is that patient which I showed you the first time in the, uh, my patient. This is how it looks like. The calcaneal pitch is restored. The, uh, the, the osteotomy is healed. And the FDL transfer was here. And that was, I, I did not use any implant, so it is not seen. So FDL transfer with the, the uh, calcaneal osteotomy and usually the stage 2P. So you, as, an, as a student, when you're examine, when you're uh, saying about surgery, you have to say about the workhorse procedure that is a medial calcaneal displacement osteotomy and an FDL transfer. What else would you do depending upon the stages? And if the stages have gone into an arthritic changes, then you do about double or triple arthritis. So there are many surgical options here. Uh, you probably don't need to go about it as a, as a, as a, as a um, um, PG student, but you should know about different combinations. You should diagnose it, clinical diagnosis, x-ray investigations, no fancy investigations most of the time necessarily, conservative management, and then there are the surgical options. The most important to come to the diagnosis is clinical examination, again, is of paramount importance. So diagnose and assess uh, the whole combination and tell your uh, treatment and your examiner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Simon. That was a great lecture. Uh, Dr. Maninder? Yes. Can we have the next lecture? Uh, because the questions we'll take at the last and also Dr. Matthew's short presentation of foot drop is remaining. So he okay. will tell us that if a case of foot drop comes, what has to be done by the postgraduates. After Rajat, we take uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mann. I think we'll just take the questions instead of making a presentation. We'll take the questions and ask their answer. No, because one person is there, Dr. Rajat is there. Na? So I think it's better that he finishes his... No, uh, I meant I'm not doing a presentation. Let the... Uh, the or, uh, Dr. Matthew, then you can just uh, describe what, what a uh, foot drop case is, then we will take a Dr. Rajat. No, let, no, let Dr. Rajat finish his presentation. Okay. I don't want you to just, make a presentation. No, no, you just tell us if a case of foot drop comes, what is expected out of the postgraduates to say. Just uh, He's been waiting for a long time. Let sir, him finish. That's okay, sir. Uh, that's fine. No, Dr. Matthew, you please uh, just tell in short and then we go to Dr. Rajat. No problem. No, yes, no. I am waiting. Okay, Rajat, please share your screen. So, Dr. Rajat is going to talk on a short case on Alex Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me. I am Rajat. I am one of the consultants working in Sir Gangaram Hospital. And I will be talking about a hallux valgus case. Usually in the examination, it will come as a short case. So if you are preparing for your MRCS or FRCS exam, then this case is important. And it's a good case to score. So you can get good marks in this one, which can compensate if you have uh, made any mistake in any other case. But it will come as a short case. It will not come as a long case. So in a short case, what happens in 
the exams is that the examiner will be with you and the patient is standing there or sitting over there and then you have to examine and take history in front of the examiner. So the question answers will go on for five to 10 minutes and that's it. So you have to be really sleek and you get in Halex Vargas case so that you can score more points over there. So first of all, what is a Halex Vargas? It's not Bunyan. There is a difference between Halex Vargas and a Bunyan. Bunyan is just a swelling over the medial joint of the joint, MTP joint, which can be because of anything, bursa, dermatitis, keratosis. But Halex Vargas is the deviation of the great toe. So the deviation of the great toe is also that the great toe goes laterally and the metatarsal, the first metatarsal goes medially, leading to the subluxation of the MTP joint. That's Halex valgus. So uh, if I can explain the anatomy to you and if I can explain what happens, why the deformity occurs, I think my job is done here. So, but for that, let's go through the anatomy. So what happens is that you have first MTP joint is a very flexible joint and it has got a lot of movement, but it can become unstable also. So there are soft tissues which are holding it in its place. So they are trying to balance the MTP joint. So on the medial side, you've got abductor hallucis, which is trying to push the phalanx medially and metatarsal head laterally. And on the opposite side of the MTP joint is ab abductor hallucis. You've got two uh, slips of ab adductor hallucis, which forms a conjoint tendon, and then that inserts on the proximal phalanx. So, and then along with that, you have got long tendons on the flexor side, as well as on the extensor side. So how the deformity starts, but before we go into that, let's look into one more important feature of the base of the first metatarsal. So if you can see my cursor over here, so that is, you are looking at it from the plantar aspect. So from below. So you can see this is a separation, a bony separation for the two sesamoid bones, and this is called as cresta. And that keeps the two sesamoids separated from each other, but it also keeps it in this place because there is a ligament which is keeping the two sesamoids together. And the uh, cresta is keeping the sesamoids in its place underneath the head of first metatarsal. So, uh, let's look into the deformity. What happens? So now if you look at this slide, now this is how a normal foot would look like. You have got on medial side, you have got abductor. On the lateral side, you have got adductor hallucis. And underneath, you have got two sesamoids, flexors, and extensor tendon. And this is cresta, which is keeping the two sesamoids together. Now, we don't know exactly what happens and why the deformity starts and which side gives in first, whether it is uh, well, when I was a student, then they used to say that it is the cresta, that the cresta becomes uh, flat, and then when the pro problem starts. But then there was another school of thought which was saying, no, it is the abductor hallucis, which becomes weak and is dysfunctional and moves plantarwards. So it comes here, and that's how the deformity starts. Or maybe there is a medial capsular attenuation, and which leads to the lateral capsular shrinkage, causing the deformity. So this is important. That will explain how the deformity happens and why you get the valgus and the pronation uh, in a hallux valgus. So let's look at this slide. So now I'm trying to explain this thing in detail that now this is your big toe. And now that's the metatarsal, which is uh, metata first metatarsal and the proximal phalanx. So what is happening is if you believe that there is attenuation of the medial side of the capsule, and then there is a shrinkage, so it is causing this lateral shift of the phalanx. So after that, the sesamoid starts to move laterally. So the holding structure, that is the cresta, which was keeping the two sesamoids underneath the head is gone. So now once the uh, cresta is gone, your sesamoids will start moving laterally. And if on an X-ray, you can see the uncovering of sesamoids, that means now the cresta is gone and this deformity is going to be progressive. So if your patient asks you that what happens, if you should, can I leave it? Is it going to progress? Yes, because there is uncovering, so it is going to progress. But at what speed, we don't know. So, and then the, we are saying that the 
abductor has also become dysfunctional. So if abductor is not stopping the metatarsal head from going medially, the adductor is still active and is pulling the great toe laterally. And this is going to cause further deformity. Plus the long tendons, the axis of the long tendons is also going to shift and that will aggravate the deformity and will cause pronation. So the pronation is also more or less, it's a combined uh, process. It's not that one thing will lead to, it ha everything goes in, but once the disease becomes progressive, uh, the pronation will come. Now, why this thing happens? Uh, we don't know. Most of it, many a times you will see that it is genetic. Females have 15 is to one ratio. You can uh, get it because of trauma also. But the other conditions that can lead to hallux valgus are inflammatory neuromuscular and connective tissue disorder. So you have to look into that also when you are thinking that is it because of this? The easy, usually you will see it is uni, one side is more deformed and it is just the big toe. But if you start seeing the lesser toes also too deformed, then you have to consider that it may be an inflammatory arthropathy. And on the opposite side also, if the condition is similar, then you are dealing with inflammatory arthropathy rather than a idiopathic hallux valgus. Now, another important point is that why footwear is important. Uh, most of the time, uh, women in a like to wear high heels and the, with the high heels, they have got a narrow toe box. So that, keeping that foot in that position with the pointy, he, uh, pointy heels and in case if your shoe size is one size smaller to uh, have to so that your foot looks good, that can aggravate your problem. But whether that causes it, we don't know. Now, when the patient comes to you, the patient will come to you with two problems, mainly pain and cosmetic. So pain is one thing that you should try to help the patient with. And for cosmetic reason, it will be a young girl coming to you asking that it doesn't look good. It is not going with the shoes or things. So she would like it to be uh, modified. So then you have to be very careful with that. And many a times that you will see that these patients will come to you in winter because they are finding it difficult to put their footwear on. And because the footwear hurts and that's when they would like to seek the medical attention. In summer, they are managing with their slippers, but in winter, they would like to go in a shoe, so that hurts. And if you look at this slide, that if, that is, that if anything goes wrong over here, it is going to create a problem. So now you have got five minutes, your examiner is standing next to you, so you have to examine the case. Now, I will not go into the detail because all my colleagues have discussed all the tests so far. So basically in five minutes, what you can do is that you start with the gait. You ask the patient to walk, you take his footwear in your hand and you examine the footwear. The footwear will give you the bumps and the wearing out of the sole and that, uh, and uh, on the bunion side also, you will be able to appreciate the wear and tear of the footwear. You look at the skin, you, it's very important in a foot and ankle case that you have to look at both the sides, the dorsal as well as the plantar. When you are looking at the patient in the standing, you are looking at it on the dorsal side. You look at the patient from the front, side, back, and then you ask the patient to sit down. And when he's sitting, you take the foot in his hand and you look at the plantar side of the foot. When the patient is walking, you should also look at the hind foot. It is not just the forefoot that you are dealing here with. You have to rule out the problems of the hind foot because the hind foot problems can lead to compensatory forefoot deformities. And the important uh, thing is that for, uh, for that, because we would like to uh, correct hind foot before doing the forefoot. So now when patients, the dictum remains the same, you feel, you look for it, you feel, and then you move. Now the important question is that when the patient says they have come with the pain, now which is the, where is the pain? Which joint is causing the pain? Is it the great toe, MTP joint or the TMT joint that is causing the pain? And is it the lesser toes which are causing? You can have transverse metatarsal here because your first tray has become dysfunctional. Now your weight bearing is mainly on the lesser toes. So you can get pain on the lesser toes. You can have overriding of the toes. You can have callosities underneath the lesser toe. But if that is because of the compensatory uh, failure, uh, because of the failure of the first tray, and then you are getting this compensatory transverse metatarsalgia, that could be the reason 
uh, that the patient has come to you for the pain. But yes, the problem is with the hallux valgus. So if you uh, correct that, that problem should also be sorted out. So then when the other important thing is that when you have got few minutes with you, you should use, you should uh, uh, practice how you are going to hold the foot uh, when the examiner is standing next to you. So there are two ways I've demonstrated that you can use it either uh, this way or you can use it either that way. And then you are trying to palpate, uh, you are trying to see the tenderness of the joints and then you are trying to move the joint. So the pronation, the deformity, is it correctable? If it is correctable, yes, it is not too bad. And then if the uh, movement of the great toe is painful, if it is painful, that means it could be because of arthrosis which is developing. So that will change your surgery. So that is why you are interested if you are dealing with an arthritic uh, or an inflammatory arthropathy and plus the mobility of the MTP joint. At the same time, you have to look at the hind foot and the neurovascular status, but that becomes, uh, that will be a very big examination. And if you mention that also that the hind foot, that you would be looking into hind foot and the neurovascular status, the examiners are going to take it for it. Uh, with you. And now the examination is of hallux valgus is never complete until unless you have examined the TMT joint because if you have got a laxity and that's the reason that you are getting a compensatory uh, hallux valgus of the TMT joint, then your surgery of dealing with the TMTP joint is going to fail. So this last test is very important. And you have to do this test few times before you can get to grips to it. And it's a subjective test. It's not very easy to do that. You stabilize the uh, hind foot and then you try to move the first metatarsal up and down to assess the laxity of the TMT joint. After doing few, you will be able to appreciate, but it is not easy. I, 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 I appreciate that. And now after the examination part is complete, the next day, would be to look at the x-rays. So you are asking for weight-bearing x-rays like we have been discussing in foot and ankle, weight-bearing x-rays are important. So in a hallux valgus case, you are looking mainly for three things, deformity, congruency, and arthrosis. So what I mean by deformity, because deformity is hallux valgus. So how bad is the deformity? You would like to classify the deformity into stages and whether the joint is congruent or not, and if you've got some arthritis in it. So let's talk about the deformity first. Now, the angles that we look at it, you can calculate the angles on a standing weight-bearing AP view. The first angle that we usually calculate is a hallux valgus. It's basically the line bisecting the first metatarsal and the phalanx, and it is usually less than 15 degrees, which is considered as normal. The next angle, important angle, is the intermetatarsal angle, which is less than nine degrees. And it is the angle between the long axis of the first and the second metatarsal. And the third angle is DMAA, which is distal metatarsal articular angle. It is not that important in the adults, but when you are dealing with a juvenile, you would definitely like to correct that also. And now coming to what is the meaning of congruency and the incongruency of the joint. Basically, uh, if you look at this picture, you can see the articular surface. If you look at this x-ray, the articular surface is from here to here of the phalanx. And so that is from X to Y. And similarly, the articular cartilage of the first metatarsal is from X dash to Y dash. So they are corresponding to each other. So this joint is congruent. Now look at this picture or this one. There is uncovering of the head of the medial side of the first metatarsal. So it has moved downwards. The joint is sublux. So this joint is not congruent. So if you are planning to do something for this case, surgically, you have to bring this joint from incongruent position to a congruent position. And now uh, arthrosis is it's like an arthritis, but now uh, after we have calculated the angles, the next stage is to decide whether the deformity is mild, moderate, or severe. So that is the classification for hallux valgus. So it's basically decided by the hallux valgus angle and the intermetatarsal angle. So anything which is between, which is less than 15 or less than nine degree for intermetatarsal is considered to be normal. And mild is hallux valgus angle of less than 20 and intermetatarsal, some people consider nine to 11, some consider nine to 13. So, but there is variation 
uh, as long as you understand why what they are talking about. And then if the deformity is severe, that means your hallux valgus angle is more than 40 and your intermetatarsal is more than 20. But at the same time, you are looking at the congruency of the MTP joint. When you are talking about a severe deformity, your joint is not congruent. So a joint with that much of deformity, with severity of that much of hallux valgus, there will be pronation and the DM, and there will be an incongruent joint. So you have to correct both of them. Now, coming on to the treatment part. So for all examination purposes, it has to start with conservative management first. Surgery is done for the failure of conservative management. And the treatment goals have changed over the time. When they started operating on hallux valgus, initially they were happy just doing the medial soft tissue release as well as lateral side release with resection of the exostosis, but then the results were poor. So in 1934, Lapidus mentioned about intermetatarsal angles and the deviation of sesamoids, and these corrections should also be done. And over the years, now we have started thinking is taking it as a, we have to look at the whole package. So how I look at it, this whole package. So for me, I, patient complaints and application are very important. What is his main complaint? Whether the radiological and the clinical signs match. The age and the lifestyle of the patient will also decide what surgery you are going to offer. The neurovascular status, general health. Plus what I would like to add is that you should also ask the expectation of the patient. If you are doing it for the cosmetic reasons, then your results are going to be poor, trust me. Now, there are, uh, like um, for hallux valgus, there are more than 100 surgeries, I think, described in literature. But that means that there is not one good surgery and that like uh, for a hip arthritis, you do a total hip replacement and everybody is happy with that. So yes, for, the, uh, uh, for examination or for satisfaction point of view, you've got a great surgery there. But if you have got so many surgeries, that means something is not right. So either we are missing something or maybe we are not doing it right. So just I will uh, tell you that where you can do the osteotomy is where you can do the surgery. So this is just the bony procedure we are talking about. And so if you start with the fellings, so you can do a medial wedge resection that's known as Aiken. You can do a fusion of MTP joint, or you can do a lapidus, which is the empty joint, and then you get a whole metatarsal. So if you do it distally, it is distal, then you can uh, distal uh, osteotomies, and if you do it on the proximal side, it is proximal, and in between is the shaft, uh, uh, shaft osteotomy. So that's how basically you have divided all the surgeries on the first ray. Now, how I decide uh, what you have to say in the exam in case if you get uh, case if you have calculated the angles or the examiner will give you the angles that it is a mild case. So for if it is a mild case, you can just do a simple distal chevron osteotomy plus minus soft tissue release in case if it needs and you will be able to achieve good correction in a mild case. But if it is a moderate case, that means your hallux valgus angle is around 37 and intermetatarsal around 17. So distal chevron osteotomy will not work. So plus this joint is incongruent. If I go back, you see the joint over here was congruent. And so you don't have to worry that much in that case. But in this case, you have to bring the joint back and make it congruent and plus the uncovering of sesamoid you can see. So that also has to be covered. So in this case, you will have to do a soft tissue release. Plus you have to do an osteotomy. Maybe you can do for shaft or maybe you can do proximal osteotomy. If it all depends on where you have been trained, if you ask me, I am very happy doing a scarf osteotomy for my moderate or severe cases. That's what I have been trained with and I'm happy with the way I've been doing and getting my results. So I am, I will do it. Plus Aiken procedure in case if there is a company, after that you see that there is a little bit of deformity which has not been corrected plus the pronation has not been corrected so you can get you can do add Aiken's procedure along with it and that usually does the trick so that's the case of a scarf osteotomy and now coming to the severe deformity so that is a severe deformity the angles of Alex valgus angle is more than 40 and now just now you have this is the case where you have to decide because you have got 
a deformity which is more than 40 degrees. And uh, so if you want to do a scarf with Akin, yes, go ahead, you can do it. But you have to also start thinking in terms of whether maybe doing a fusion, uh, whether maybe doing something more proximal would help. So whichever way you have to decide, you decide and discuss it with your patient, or maybe you can explain uh, to your examiner also that you can do something which is more proximal, uh, or maybe do a procedure over here because uh, for like a lapidus procedure, or you can do an MTP arthrodesis also. Now, if you have got a hypermobility at the TMT joint, so then definitely you have to work on the TMT joint and you may the best procedure would be to do a lapidus procedure fusion here and if you do a fusion here you will be able to correct the intermetatarsal angle and the correction you, you can achieve a very nice correction over here and if it is an arthritic joint then you do an arthrodesis yes Keller's procedure is also there where you resect the proximal third of the proximal uh, proximal part of the proximal phalanx but that should be condemned. It's not a good procedure. Patient does not like it and they get a cock, you know, cock up deformity after that. Uh, but in some situations, you may have to do it. And so if we come to the discussion part of the surgery for hallux valves, it mainly has got two components. You have to look at the bony as well as the soft tissue balancing. Rajat, please wrap up. Yeah, this is the last slide. So I, I'll, uh, so both the deformities has to be addressed. Otherwise, your surgery is going to fail. Now, just and the other thing is just correcting the hallux valgus angle is not going to solve the purpose. You have to correct the intermetatarsal. So both the angles have to be corrected. If you are doing any soft, uh, any bony procedure, you will end up with shortening of the first metatarsal. So the shortening of first metatarsal will lead to transverse metatarsalgia on the second and third. So you don't want to do that. So you would like to maintain the length of first metatarsal. So maintain as much as possible. For that, I think scarf osteotomy is good. It helps you to do that. And if you have managed to do everything right, you should be able to relieve the lesser ray transverse metatarsalgia after this. Uh, I think we will stop here. I would not like to go into the details of the surgery as we are getting late. So uh, if uh, that's it, Dr. Manish, I think I will uh, yeah. I'll finish. Thank here. you. Thank you, Rajat, for a very nice presentation. Uh, no. Dr. Maninder, can we call Dr. Matthews for a few points on foot drop? Sure, because sure. We have already Absolutely. Dr. Absolutely. Matthews. Yeah. Dr. Matthew, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm really wondering whether it's wise to go in at this stage and then everyone must be tired and hungry. I must be standing between dinner and uh, their sleep. Um, and we are also violating principles of teaching. That is, you should not, the attention span of people wouldn't be that long, sustained for so long. Anyway, since you have requested me, I'll say, Foot drop is a common choice in any exam. Foot drop can be part of a non-union case that has been presented to you, or it could be by itself a short case for you. So the first thing is, what is your diagnosis? So, sir, so this is a case of foot drop, secondary to a lateral popliteal nerve palsy. Why did the lateral popliteal nerve palsy happen? That's a secondary. So either there has been a fracture or it has been an infective process like Hansen or it is a surgical intervention or some other reason because of which it has had it. So sometimes you have hip replacements done, hip hip and they deal with a shatic nerve palsy and a residual recovery is happening and the residual foot drop is there. So the first thing is, what is the cause? You get into the history, get into the examination. Is the cause an infective process? So look for hip, uh, the Hansen's disease as a problem. Fortunately, it is very infrequently seen now and therefore we don't look at that and very often centers don't keep Hansen's disease. Most prominently, it's a case. So either it is a direct trauma to the lateral popliteal nerve or an indirect trauma secondary to a fracture. Indirect trauma secondary to a fracture. 
So you have to know where is the fracture. You have to know where is the fracture. So you describe this is secondary to the fracture. You put this fibula, it's lateral popliteal. It is posterior dislocation. If it is um, THR done and secondary to that cause the lateral popliteal, then you'll be able to explain that. So lateral popliteal, post-traumatic or post-surgical intervention. Then always feel for the pulses as was mentioned by Dr. Jha. But you have to feel for the pulses. Maybe it is part of a VIC. You have to be sure it looks like foot drop. It may not be just foot drop. It may be part of a VIC. So feel for the pulses. There may be absent pulses. There it can Never come in without checking for the pulses. So post-traumatic lateral popliteal nerve palsy at what level? So the purpose of a neurological examination is find out the level, and the nature of the deficiency. So the level you have to specify as part of a neurological. Where is the paralysis? Is it at the neck of the fibula, or is it a sciatic notch, or is it else? The examination has to guide you to that. Then the question comes: If it is a hip replacement case with a lateral popliteal nerve palsy, lateral popliteal nerve palsy. So the candidate must know when a sciatic nerve is stretched, the lateral popliteal is the most vulnerable. You should know why is it the most vulnerable. It is the most vulnerable because it is fixed to bony the greater sciatic notch, or there is the neck of the fibula. And any stretch in puts a stretch on the second reason. The nerve, if you take a cross section of it, the vascularity of the nerve or the lateral popliteal component of the sciatic nerve is less than that of the main sciatic tibial component. Therefore, the nerve is more vulnerable to a stretch than the vessels. If you look at the cross section of the nerve, the sciatic component, there is more interzonal, interneural tissue. So when the nerve is pressed, the interneural tissue in the lateral popliteal component is less. So the buffer withstanding pressure damage is less in the lateral popliteal than in the other side. That is why the nerve is more vulnerable to damage. And also the neck of the fibula, where you can have a mesony injury, as Dr. Dreja said, or you have a neck of fibula fracture from an indirect fracture twisting injury or you have a direct injury because the superficial nerve on the posterolateral part of the fibula, neck of the fibula is the posterolateral portion. So that is so that is your diagnosis, your level. What do you do? Why not shatic? Again, shatic would mean the sensory deficit on the sole of the foot. The sensory deficit is more than the first digital space on the dorsum of the foot. Lateral popliteal, the area of autonomic supply is in the first web space on the dorsum of the foot. If it is sciatic nerve, the whole of the sole of the foot extending laterally and posteriorly is anesthetic. So the sensory deficit gives you a clue to whether it is sciatic nerve or lateral popliteal. Student must check for the long toe flexors the short toe flexors and the muscles of the foot. Test for the muscles. That will give you a clue. In lateral popliteal, only the lateral compartment and the anterior compartment muscles are affected, which means the peroneal compartment and the anterior tibial compartment are affected. Lateral crural, anterior crural muscles are affected. In sciatic nerve, you may have some muscles from the plantar surface also affected. Watch out for that. Check for it. So you should know how to check for all the muscles. Then, you've made a diagnosis. What do you first look at? Has the primary problem resolved? And do you need to do anything? And what is the time that has elapsed? Because of the reasons that I mentioned the anatomical, repair of lateral popliteal nerve, the results aren't very good. Except 
in an acute sharp cut by a sharp injury to the neck of the fibula or up or below you immediately or delayed primary repair has been done by an expert you may have a good result but by and large most lateral popliteal nerve palsies do not recur by and large they you're lucky so give time yes would give time because you have recovery happening especially if it is a hansen's disease you have recognized it run a decompression of the nerve and treatment is done and the patient starts to it's possible but that's a rarity so what do you do in the interim phase do therapy dorsiflexion plantar flexion to prevent an equinus give a foot drop splint a common mistake is to say ankle foot orthosis an ankle foot orthosis the rigid ankle foot orthosis which doesn't allow c flexion and if you walk on that your triceps surae wastes your ankle becomes stiff you don't want that you want a dynamic splint which can allow so it's an in shoe in foot drop splint which allows dorsiflexion so that has to be clearly it's a ready made splint which allows dorsiflexion but doesn't allow plantar you don't want the foot to go into equinus but you allow dorsiflexion and prevent a foot drop leading into equinus that's what you do do i do repairs except in sharp cuts i don't do repairs do i do tendon transfer do tendon transfer what tendon transfer do because the lateral compartment muscles are gone because the anterior compartment are gone you have the only other muscle available is tibialis posterior tibialis posterior transfer over the anterior portion of the tibia or the obers transfer or trans interosseous or bars transfer the trans interosseous is what i prefer to do the tendon is behind the interosseous membrane so you take away the tendon from and you have to dissect it distally as far distally as possible from the navicular tuberosity with a little periosteum around it gives you maximum length if it is short you won't be able to put it into the bone on the middle of the mid tarsal bone so you need to take it away from there and bring it out through a liberal window in the interosseous membrane a liberal window actually makes a posterior compartment muscle into an anterior compartment muscle why it and take it to be inserted depending on the muscle power that is available if there is nothing else available in the middle of the tarsal middle cuneiform is where you put if you have some that is there which allows something else usually in this kind of a situation you will put it into the middle cuneiform i won't put it laterally to prevent a lateral deformity i won't put it medially to prevent a middle deformity i'll just put it into the middle uniform through a cold procedure make a drill and pull out suture to the plantar surface given for 6 weeks and then brace to protect the tendon transfer for 6 weeks and leave it free many times people ask won't you do a triple arthrodesis that is a classical teaching as dr jha mentioned we don't want to fuse the joints as far as possible why walking on uneven ground barefoot walking becomes difficult with triple arthrodesis you are happy doing it in polio because you're going to give a brace or you're going to do some other stabilization which is there in this no you do want to avoid it earlier teaching was first do a triple reduce the number of joints across which the tendon is working and then do it the second problem is non phasic transfer what do you mean by non phasic tibialis posterior is a stance phase muscle tibialis anterior is a swing phase muscle phase conversion does not happen in adults then how does it work most of the time it works by tino decision so that's the summary first find out it is truly a lateral popliteal and not a shat tick with a lateral popliteal component which is residual second the level of the lesion neck of fibula in the shaft of the femur in the hip joint in the greater shatic nerve or a notch higher up then once you diagnose you do wait conservatively anyway about 3 months is what i would give maximum not more than that and then try to do a tendon transfer 
do i do a diagnostics routinely no unless for real purposes i want to show that this is the deficit and therefore i am planning this otherwise i would not like to do electro diagnostics are not normally required to electrical stimulation if you are planning if you think that it is going to recover and you see some faint signs of recovery and you want to continue electrical stimulation to prevent the neuromuscular that's it can i stop here yes sir thank you very much thank you we are totally enlightened by your presentation because i okay. think if i don't stop it will keep on going because everyone wants to listen to you and you are a very wanted person so i think uh, uh, there are so many questions which uh, i it's not the proper time to take because already we are nearing 11 o'clock so i think we have to wrap it up uh, dr sharad yes dr sharad yeah i i think that you are too exhausted no not at all should we do uh, should we close it now then yeah we have to close it now because we have already reaching 11 o'clock so, so i can't take questions. Uh, questions but i think yes we are late uh well uh, thanks a lot to the to the enlightened yes. and uh, uh, to, uh, to enlighten us by, uh, by this uh, uh, eminent uh, faculty we have dr matthews dr loksu dr kamal dureja dr simon dr chopra dr marinder and our uh, senior panelists dr jha and dr gora spending uh, finding time spending with us and enlightening our pgs and uh, special thanks to dr manish being the moderator dr ravi chohan and dr samshul soda dr uh, ashok sham and uh, for uh, making this all possible and thanks to our sponsor jadas cadela and sir dr sharad i will take this opportunity to just have few words from dr rajiv and dr uh, jha just yeah, to please give under please dr jha please So you are muted. She can't hear you, sir. This has been a wonder. So you mute, muted again. Sorry. So thank you very much for letting us go through this entertaining evening, and I must say, I have also learned few points. so this has been very useful every topic was so charged even the last one by rajat chopra had so much of clarity and clarity at a place where hundreds of surgeries are described i must congratulate each and every speaker you have been all so thank very you, much brilliant thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you dr cha i think i need to uh, speak the same things so i may not repeat it again and i would just like to thank everyone for this wonderful interactive sort of session yeah i i'm sure everyone must have learned from each others uh, even if the panelists have learned uh, i think even pgs will learn a lot even if panelists learn thank you thank you very much well in lighter vein i am reminded when i was hearing about polio patients professor sureshwar pande was an internal examiner at ranchi and a case of polio was kept as one of the short cases the external i will not name him he said you want the candidate to be examined or you are examining me thank you <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Matthews, for such a great presentation, and thank, thank all the faculty. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was a neat pleasure yes, listening to Professor Vargas and thank all you. of you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. It was a marathon session, but well worth it. Thank worth you. it. Everything <laughs> will be available on the YouTube. So all the lectures will be available on the YouTube. Thank you, Dr. Shamsul. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Please. Thank you from also giving side, sir. I'm stopping the recording and live stream, sir. Uh, we are offline now, no? Okay. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you, sir.